Hind Swaraj, written by Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, an oral cinematic experience, narrated by Ranjan Kamath, editor. Rishab Kamath as reader one. Ahan Kamath as reader two. Produced by Ahan Kamath for the C Positive Foundation. Introduction to Hind Swaraj. Hind Swaraj is Mahatma Gandhi's fundamental work. It is a key to understanding not only his life and thought, but also the politics of South Asia in the first half of the 20th century. Hind Swaraj is Gandhi's seminal work. It is also a work which he himself translated from Gujarati into English. It was through this, not the Gujarati text, that he hoped, as he put it, to use the British race for transmitting his mighty message of Ahimsa to the rest of the world. And it was to this text that he returned throughout his career as if to the source of his inspiration. Hind Swaraj is the seed from which the tree of Gandhian thought has grown to its full stature. For those interested in Gandhi's thought in a general way, it is the right place to start, for it is here that he presents his basic ideas in their proper relationship to one another. The very composition of Hind Swaraj has something of the heroic about it. It was written in 10 days between 13 and 22nd November 1909 on board the ship Kildonan Castle on the author's return trip from England to South Africa after what proved to be an abortive lobbying mission to London. The whole manuscript was written on the ship's stationery and the writing went on at such a furious pace that when the right hand got tired, Gandhi continued with the left. Forty of the 275 manuscript pages were written by the left hand. And he wrote as if under inspiration. In the entire autograph, only 16 lines have been scratched out and only a few words changed here and there. Critics speak of Gandhi's profound experience of illumination on board the Kildonan Castle. At any event, Gandhi himself felt that he had produced an original work. Gandhi's Intentions The book is addressed to a mixed audience. The expatriate Indians, greatly attracted to terrorism and political violence, the extremists and moderates of the Indian National Congress, the Indian Nation, and the English. By the Indian nation, Gandhi means ordinary Indians, irrespective of their religious, linguistic, regional or caste differences, as well as the new emerging middle class, referred to in the text as doctors, lawyers and the wealthy. And by the English, he means both the British ruling class living in India and Britons living in Great Britain. As to why he wrote the book, I have written because I could not restrain myself. Years later, he recalled the experience. Just as one cannot help speaking out when one's heart is full, so also I have been unable to restrain myself from writing the book since my heart was full. Secondly, he wanted to clarify the meaning of Swaraj the concept that provides the theoretical framework of the book. This is done by introducing a distinction between Swaraj as self-government or the quest for home rule or the good state and Swaraj as self-rule or the quest for self-improvement. Thirdly, he felt it necessary to respond specifically to the ideology of political terrorism adopted by the expatriates. The book was written in order to show that they were following a suicidal policy. Fourthly, 
Gandhi was anxious to teach the Indians that modern civilization posed a greater threat to them than did colonialism. They appeared to him to take it for granted that modern civilization was an unmixed blessing and colonialism an unmixed evil, forgetting that colonialism itself was a product of modern civilization. The key to an understanding of Hind Swaraj lies in the idea that worldly pursuits should give way to ethical living. This way of life has no room for violence in any form against any human being, black or white. And in 1939, the key to understand that incredibly simple booklet is to realize that it is not an attempt to go back to the so-called ignorant dark ages, but it is an attempt to see beauty in voluntary simplicity, poverty and slowness. I have pictured that as my ideal. I would ask you to read Hind Swaraj with my eyes. He exhorts the reader. Finally, Gandhi believed that through Hind Swaraj he would be able to give Indians a practical philosophy, an updated conception of dharma that would fit them for life in the modern world. Gandhi felt that the time had come to redefine the scope of dharma to include notions of citizenship, equality, liberty, fraternity and mutual assistance. And in Hind Swaraj, he presents in simple language his notion of such a redefined dharma, the vision of a new Indian or Gandhian civic humanism, one that the Gita and the Ramayana had always contained in potentia but something which Indian civilization had not actualized fully in practice. In Hind Swaraj, a conscious attempt is being made to actualize that potential. This is not a mere political book, he writes. I have used language of politics, but I have really tried to offer a glimpse of dharma. What is the meaning of Hind Swaraj? It means rule of dharma or Ram Rajya. We may read the Gita or the Ramayana or Hind Swaraj, but what we have to learn from them is desire for the welfare of others. On a casual listening, the book may strike the listener as being a rather simple one. This would not be an unwarranted reaction since Gandhi sought simplicity in all things, including the way he presented his ideas. But first impressions in this case can be and are deceptive. For the book contains in compressed form the author's conception of what modern India ought to become and how politics may be made into the highest form of the active life. Preface to the English Translation it is not without hesitation that the translation of Hind Swaraj is submitted to the public. A European friend with whom I discussed the contents wanted to see a translation of it and during our spare moments I hurriedly dictated and he took it down. It is not a literal translation but it is a faithful rendering of the original. Several English friends have read it, and whilst opinions were being invited as to the advisability of publishing the work, news was received that the original was seized in India. This information hastened the decision to publish the translation without a moment's delay. My fellow workers at the International Printing Press shared my view, and by working overtime, a labor of love, they have enabled me to place the translation before the public in an unexpectedly short time. The work is being given to the public at what is practically cost price, but without the financial assistance of the many Indians who promised to buy copies for themselves and for distribution, it might never have seen the light of day. I am quite aware of the many imperfections in the original. The English rendering, besides sharing these, must naturally exaggerate them owing to my inability to convey the exact meaning of the original. 
Some of the friends who have read the translation have objected that the subject matter has been dealt with in the form of a dialogue. I have no answer to offer to this objection, except that the Gujarati language readily lends itself to such treatment and that it is considered the best method of treating difficult subjects. Had I written for English readers in the first instance, the subject would have been handled in a different manner. Moreover, the dialogue as it has been given actually took place between several friends, mostly readers of Indian opinion and myself. Whilst the views expressed in Henswaraj are held by me, I have but endeavoured humbly to follow Tolstoy, Ruskin, Thoreau, Emerson and other writers, besides the masters of Indian philosophy. Tolstoy has been one of my teachers for a number of years. Those who want to see a corroboration of the views submitted in the following chapters will find it in the works of the above-named masters. Had I not known that there was a danger of methods of violence becoming popular, even in South Africa, had I not been called upon by hundreds of my countrymen and not a few English friends to express my opinion on the nationalist movement in India, I would even have refrained for the sake of the struggle from reducing my views in writing. But occupying the position I do, it would have been cowardice on my path to postpone publication under the circumstances just referred to. M. K. Gandhi, Johannesburg, March 20th, 1910 Forward I have written some chapters on the subject of Indian home rule which I venture to place before the readers of Indian opinion. I have written because I could not restrain myself. I have read much, I have pondered much during the stay for four months in London of the Transvaal Indian deputation. I discussed things with as many of my countrymen as I could. I met, too, as many Englishmen as it was possible for me to meet. I considered it my duty now to place before the readers of Indian opinion the conclusions which appear to me to be final. The Gujarati subscribers of Indian opinion number about 800. I am aware that for every subscriber there are at least 10 persons who read the paper with zest. Those who cannot read Gujarati have the paper read to them. Such persons have often questioned me about the condition of India. Similar questions were addressed to me in London. I felt, therefore, that it might not be improper for me to ventilate publicly the views expressed by me in private. These views are mine and yet not mine. They are mine because I hope to act according to them. They are almost a part of my being, but yet they are not mine because I lay no claim to originality. They have been formed after reading several books, that which I dimly felt received support from these books. The views I venture to place before the reader are, needless to say, held by many Indians not touched by what is known as civilization. But I ask the reader to believe me when I tell him that they are also held by thousands of Europeans. Those who wish to dive deep and have time may read certain books themselves. If time permits me, I hope to translate portions of such books for the benefit of the readers of Indian opinion. If the readers of Indian opinion and others who may see the following chapters will pass their criticism on to me, I shall feel obliged to them. The only motive is to serve my country, to find out the truth and to follow it. If, therefore, my views are proved to be wrong, I shall have no hesitation in rejecting them. If they are proved to be right, I would naturally wish for the sake of the motherland that others should adopt them. 
To make it easy reading, the chapters are written in the form of a dialogue between the reader and the editor. M. K. Gandhi, Kildonan Castle, November 22nd, 1909. Do you expect England this time will uh, give India full self-government? That also is more than I can say. But you are hopeful. I am an optimist. You are an optimist. Chapter 1 The Congress and its Officials Just at present, there is a home rule wave passing over India. All our countrymen appear to be pining for national independence. A similar spirit pervades them even in South Africa. Indians seem to be eager after acquiring rights. Will you explain your views in this matter? You have well put the question. But the answer is not easy. One of the objects of a newspaper is to understand the popular feeling and to give expression to it. Another is to arouse among the people certain desirable sentiments and the third is fearlessly to expose popular defects. The exercise of all these three functions is involved in answering your question. To a certain extent, the people's will has to be expressed. Certain sentiments will need to be fostered and defects will have to be brought to light. But as you have asked the question, it is my duty to answer it. Do you then consider that a desire for home rule has been created among us? That desire gave rise to the National Congress. The choice of the word national implies it. That surely is not the case. Young India seems to ignore the Congress. It is considered to be an instrument for perpetuating British rule. That opinion is not justified. Had not the grand old man of India prepared the soil, our young men could not have even spoken about home rule. How can we forget what Mr. Hume has written, how he has lashed us into action, and with what effort he has awakened us in order to achieve the objects of the Congress? Sir William Wedderburn has given his body, mind and money to the same cause. His writings are worthy of perusal to this day. Professor Gokhale, in order to prepare the nation, embraced poverty and gave 20 years of his life. Even now he is living in poverty. The late Justice Badruddin Tayabji was also one of those who through the Congress sowed the seed of home rule. Similarly, in Bengal, Madras, the Punjab and other places, there have been lovers of India and members of the Congress, both Indian and English. Stay, stay. You are going too far. You are straying away from my question. I have asked you about home or self-rule. You are discussing foreign rule. I do not desire to hear English names and you are giving me such names. In these circumstances, I do not think we can ever meet. I shall be pleased if you will confine yourself to home rule. All other wise talk will not satisfy me. I cannot afford to be likewise. If you will bear with me for a while, I think you will find that you will obtain what you want. Remember the old proverb that the tree does not grow in one day? The fact that you have checked me and that you do not want to hear about the well-wishers of India shows that for you, at any rate, home rule is yet far away. If we had many like you, we would never make any advance. This thought is worthy of your attention. It seems to me that you simply want to put me off by talking round and round. 
those whom you consider to be well-wishers of India are not such in my estimation. Why then should I listen to your discourse on such people? What is he whom you consider to be the father of the nation done for it? He says that the English governors will do justice and that we should cooperate with them. I must tell you with all gentleness that it must be a matter of shame for us that you should speak about that great man in terms of disrespect. Just look at his work. He has dedicated his life to the service of India. We have learned what we know from him. It was the respected Dada Bhai who taught us that the English had sucked our lifeblood. What does it matter that today his trust is still in the English nation? Is Dadhabai less to be honoured because in the exuberance of youth we are prepared to go a step further? Are we on that account wiser than he? It is a mark of wisdom not to kick against the very step from which we have risen higher. The removal of a step from a staircase brings down the whole of it. When out of infancy we grow into youth, we do not despise infancy, but on the contrary, we recall with affection the days of our childhood. If after many years of study, a teacher were to teach me something, and if I were to build a little more on the foundation laid by that teacher, I would not on that account be considered wiser than the teacher. He would always command my respect. Such is the case with the grand old man of India. We must admit that he is the author of nationalism. You have spoken well. I can now understand that we must look upon Mr. Dadabai with respect. Without him and men like him, we would probably not have the spirit that fires us. How can the same be said of Professor Gokhale? He has constituted himself a great friend of the English. He says that we have to learn a great deal from them, that we have to learn their political wisdom before we can talk of home rule. I am tired of reading his speeches. If you are tired, it only betrays your impatience. We believe that those who are discontented with the slowness of their parents and are angry because the parents would not run with their children are considered disrespectful to their parents. Professor Gokhale occupies the place of a parent. What does it matter if he cannot run with us? A nation that is desirous of securing home rule cannot afford to despise its ancestors. We shall become useless if we lack respect for our elders. Only men with mature thoughts are capable of ruling themselves and not the hasty tempered. Moreover, how many Indians were there like Professor Gokhale when he gave himself to Indian education? I verily believe that whatever Professor Gokhale does, he does with pure motives and with a view to serving India. His devotion to the motherland is so great that he would give his life for it, if necessary. Whatever he says is said not to flatter anyone, but because he believes it to be true. We are bound, therefore, to entertain the highest regard for him. Are we then to follow him in every respect? I never said any such thing. If we conscientiously deferred from him, the learned professor himself would advise us to follow the dictates of our conscience rather than him. Our chief purpose is not to cry down his work, but to believe that he is infinitely greater than we, and to feel assured that compared with his work for India, ours is infinitesimal. Several newspapers write disrespectfully of him. It is our duty to protest against such writings. We should consider men like Professor Gokhale to be the pillars of home rule. It is a bad habit to say that another man's thoughts are bad and ours only are good, and that those holding different views from ours are the enemies of the country. I now begin to understand somewhat your meaning. I shall have to think the matter over. 
But what you say about Mr. Hume and Sir William Wedderburn is beyond comprehension. The same rule holds good for the English as for the Indians. I can never subscribe to the statement that all the Englishmen are bad. Many Englishmen desire home rule for India. That the English people are somewhat more selfish than others is true, but that does not prove that every Englishman is bad. We who seek justice will have to do justice to others. Sir William does not wish ill to India. That should be enough for us. As we proceed, you will see that if we act justly, India will be sooner free. You will see too that if we shun every Englishman as an enemy, home rule will be delayed. But if we are just to them, we shall receive their support in our progress towards the goal. All this seems to me at present to be simply nonsensical. English support and the obtaining of home rule are two contradictory things. How can the English people tolerate home rule for us? But I do not want you to decide this question for me just yet. To pass time over it is useless. When you have shown how we can have home rule, perhaps I shall understand your views. You have prejudiced me against you by discoursing on English help. I would therefore beseech you not to continue this subject. I have no desire to do so. That you are prejudiced against me is not a matter for much anxiety. It is well that I should say unpleasant things at the commencement. It is my duty patiently to try to remove your prejudice. I like that last statement. It emboldens me to say what I like. One thing still puzzles me. I do not understand how the Congress laid the foundation of Home Rule. Let us see. The Congress brought together Indians from different parts of India and enthused us with the idea of nationality. The government used to look upon it with disfavor. The Congress has always insisted that the nation should control revenue and expenditure. It has always desired self-government after the Canadian model. Whether we can get it or not, whether we desire it or not, and whether there is not something more desirable are different questions. All I have to show is that the Congress gave us a foretaste of home rule. To deprive it of the honor is not proper, and for us to do so would not only be ungrateful, but retard the fulfillment of our object. To treat the Congress as an institution inimical to our growth as a nation would disable us from using that body. Chapter 2 The Partition of Bengal Considering the matter as you put it, it seems proper to say that the foundation of Home Rule was laid by the Congress. But you will admit that it cannot be considered a real awakening. When and how did the real awakening take place? The seed is never seen. It works underneath the ground, is itself destroyed, and the tree which rises above the ground is alone seen. Such is the case with the Congress. Yet, what you call the real awakening took place after the partition of Bengal. For this we have to be thankful to Lord Curzon. 
At the time of the partition, the people of Bengal reasoned with Lord Curzon, but in the pride of power, he disregarded all their prayers. He took it for granted that Indians could only prattle, that they could never take any effective steps. He used insulting language and in the teeth of all opposition, partitioned Bengal. That day may be considered to be the day of the partition of the British Empire. The shock that the British power received through the partition has never been equaled by any other act. This does not mean that the other injustices done to India are less glaring than that done by the partition. The salt tax is not a small injustice. We shall see many such things later on, but the people were ready to resist the partition. At that time, the feeling ran high. Many leading Bengalis were ready to lose their all. They knew their power, hence the conflagration. It is now well nigh unquenchable. It is not necessary to quench it either. Partition will go, Bengal will be reunited, but the rift in the English Baroque will remain. It must daily widen. India awakened is not likely to fall asleep. Demand for abrogation of partition is tantamount to demand for home rule. Leaders in Bengal know this. British officials realize it. That is why partition still remains. As time passes, the nation is being forged. Nations are not formed in a day. The formation requires years. What, in your opinion, are the results of partition? Hitherto we have considered that, for redress of grievances, we must approach the throne, and if we get no redress, we must still accept that we may still petition. After the partition, people saw that petitions must be backed up by force, and that they must be capable of suffering. This new spirit must be considered to be the chief result of partition. That spirit was seen in the outspoken writings in the press. That which the people said tremblingly and in secret began to be said and to be written publicly. The Swadeshi movement was inaugurated. People, young and old, used to run away at the sight of an English face. It now no longer awed them. They did not fear even a row or being imprisoned. Some of the best sons of India are at present in banishment. This is something different from mere petitioning. Thus are the people moved. The spirit generated in Bengal has spread to the north, to the Punjab, and in the south, to Cape Comoran. Do you suggest any other striking result? The partition has not only made a rift in the English ship, but has made it in ours also. Great events always produce great results. Our leaders are divided into two parties, the moderates and the extremists. These may be considered as the slow party and the impatient party. Some call the moderates the timid party and the extremists the bold party. All interpret the two words according to their preconceptions. This much is certain, that there has risen an enmity between the two. The one distrusts the other and imputes motives. At the time of the Surat Congress, there was almost a fight. I think that this division is not a good thing for the country. But I think also that such divisions will not last long. It all depends upon the leaders and how long they will last. Chapter 3 Discontent and Unrest
then you consider partition to be a cause of the awakening? Do you welcome the unrest which has resulted from it? When a man rises from sleep, he twists his limbs and is restless. It takes some time before he is entirely awakened. Similarly, although the partition has caused an awakening, the comatose state has not yet disappeared. We are still twisting our limbs and still restless, and just as the state between sleep and awakening must be considered to be necessary, so may the present unrest in India be considered a necessary and therefore a proper state. The knowledge that there is unrest will, it is highly probable, enable us to outgrow it. Rising from sleep, we do not continue in a comatose state. But according to our ability, sooner or later, we are completely restored to our senses. So shall we be free from the present unrest, which no one likes. What is the other form of unrest? Unrest is, in reality, discontent. The latter is only now described as unrest. During the Congress period, it was labelled discontent. Mr. Hume always said that the spread of discontent in India was necessary. This discontent is a very useful thing, so long as a man is contented with his present lot, so long is it difficult to persuade him to come out of it. Therefore, it is that every reform must be preceded by discontent. We throw away things we have only when we cease to like them. Such discontent has been produced among us after reading the great works of Indians and Englishmen. Discontent has led to unrest, and the latter has brought about many deaths, many imprisonments, many banishments. Such a state of things will still continue. It must be so. All these may be considered good signs, but they may also lead to bad results. Chapter 4 Historical Context The Indian Nationalist Movement The Raj, among other things, made one historic contribution to India's development. It occasioned the fundamental debate on the nature of her national identity, which in some ways continues to this day. Gandhi states his case in Hind Swaraj. It is that Indians have a common identity, that they constitute a praja, nation, a term newly introduced by Hind Swaraj, and that Indian nationalism should never legitimize violence as a means of national liberation. As a journalist in South Africa, Gandhi was quite well informed of what was going on in the subcontinent. Increasing numbers of the rising generation of the politically conscious Indian middle class were being strongly attracted to modern civilization and political violence. The moderates stood for Swaraj, defined as self-government within the empire, achieved through the constitutional means of gradual reforms granted by the imperial parliament. Mere constitutionalism, Gandhi knew from his South African experience, did not get anywhere, nor did it raise the fundamental moral issue of the reform of the soul, which for Gandhi was a precondition for sound politics. Swaraj of the type he had envisaged could not be attained without the reform of the soul, and this separated him from the moderates as a group. The extremists stood for Swaraj, defined as complete sovereignty, achieved through constitutional means if possible, but through other means if necessary. In short, 
The moderates have begun well with good intentions, but it is time that they rethought their goals, methods, and priorities. For there is an alternative to both uncreative constitutionalism and violent extremism. Chapter 4 What is Swaraj? I have now learnt what the Congress has done to make India one nation, how the partition has caused an awakening and how discontent and unrest have spread through the land. I would now like to know your views on Swaraj. I fear that our interpretation is not the same. It is quite possible that we do not attach the same meaning to the term. You and I and all Indians are impatient to obtain Swaraj, but we are certainly not decided as to what it is. To drive the English out of India is a thought heard from many mouths, but it does not seem that many have properly considered why it should be so. I must ask you a question. Do you think that it is necessary to drive away the English if we get all we want? I should ask of them only one thing, that is, please leave our country. If after they have complied with this request, their withdrawal from India means that they are still in India, I should have no objection. Then we would understand that in our language, the word gone is equivalent to remained. Well, then let us suppose that the English have retired. What will you do then? That question cannot be answered at this stage. The state after withdrawal will depend largely upon the manner of it. If, as you assume, they retire, it seems to me we shall still keep their constitution and shall carry on the government. If they simply retire for the asking, we should have an army etc. ready at hand. We should therefore have no difficulty in carrying on the government. You may think so, I do not. But I will not discuss the matter just now. I have to answer the question and that I can do well by asking you several questions. Why do we want to drive away the English? Because India has become impoverished by their government. They take away our money from year to year. The most important posts are reserved for themselves. We are kept in a state of slavery. They behave insolently towards us and disregard our feelings. If they do not take our money away, become gentle and give us responsible posts, would you still consider their presence to be harmful? That question is useless. It is similar to the question whether there is any harm in associating with a tiger if he changes his nature. Such a question is a sheer waste of time. When a tiger changes his nature, Englishmen will change theirs. This is not possible, and to believe it is to be possible is contrary to human experience. Supposing we get self-government, similar to what the Canadians and the South Africans have, will it be good enough? That question also is useless. We may get it when we have arms and ammunition even as they have. But when we have the same powers, we shall hoist our own flag. As in Japan, so must India be. We must own our navy, our army, and we must have our own splendor. And then will India's voice ring through the world. You have well drawn the picture. In effect, it means this, that we want English rule without the Englishman. You want the tiger's nature, but not the tiger. That is to say, you would make India English, and when it becomes English, it will be called not Hindustan, but Englishstan. That is not the Swaraj that I want. I have placed before you my idea of Swaraj as I think it should be. If the education we have received be of any use, if the works of Spencer, Mill and others be of any importance, and if the English Parliament be the mother of parliaments, 
I certainly think that we should copy the English people. And this to such an extent that just as they do not allow others to obtain a footing in their country, so should we not allow them or others to obtain it in ours. What they have done in their own country has not been done in any other country. It is therefore proper for us to import their institutions. But now I want to know your views. There is need for patience. My views will develop of themselves in the course of this discourse. It is as difficult for me to understand the true nature of Swaraj as it seems to you to be easy. I shall therefore, for the time being, content myself with endeavouring to show that what you call Swaraj is not truly Swaraj. Of India. Our first glimpse as the Rajputana came alongside at Marseille. And here comes Mr. Gandhi, dressed as he said he would be, in just his loincloth, even in the chilly climes of Europe. And he's carrying with him his pots and pans, which he declared at the customs. And so to his poplar home, where we leave this bizarre little man, whose coming has caused so much comment, complete with loincloth, spinning wheel and goat's milk feeling sure that he cannot complain of his reception or the publicity he has received, from which, by the way, we always understood that he shrank. Chapter 5. The Condition of England Then, from your statement, I deduce that the government of England is not desirable and not worth copying by us? Your deduction is justified. The condition of England at present is pitiable. I pray to God that India may never be in that plight. That which you consider to be the mother of parliaments is like a sterile woman and a prostitute. Both these are harsh terms but exactly fit the case. That parliament has not yet of its own accord done a single good thing. Hence I have compared it to a sterile woman. The natural condition of that parliament is such that without outside pressure it can do nothing. It is like a prostitute because it is under the control of ministers who change from time to time. Today it is under Mr. Asketh, Tomorrow it may be under Mr. Balfour. You have said this sarcastically. The term sterile woman is not applicable. The parliament being elected by the people must work under public pressure. This is its quality. You are mistaken. Let us examine it a little more closely. The best men are supposed to be elected by the people. The members serve without pay, and therefore it must be assumed only for the public will. The electors are considered to be educated, and therefore we should assume that they would not generally make mistakes in their choice. Such a parliament should not need the spur of petitions or any other pressure. Its work should be so smooth that its effect would be more apparent day by day. But as a matter of fact, it is generally acknowledged that the members are hypocritical and selfish. Each thinks of his own little interest. It is fear that is the guiding motive. 
What is done today may be undone tomorrow. It is not possible to recall a single instance in which finality can be predicated for its work. When the greatest questions are debated, its members have been seen to stretch themselves and to doze. Sometimes the members talk away until the listeners are disgusted. Carlyle has called it the talking shop of the world. Members vote for their party without a thought. Their so-called discipline binds them to it. If any member, by way of exception, gives an independent vote, he is considered a renegade. If the money and the time wasted by the parliament were entrusted to a few good men, the English nation would be occupying today a much higher platform. The parliament is simply a costly toy of the nation. These views are by no means peculiar to me. Some great English thinkers have expressed them. One of the members of that parliament recently said that a true Christian could not become a member of it. Another said that it was a baby, and if it has remained a baby after an existence of 700 years, when will it outgrow its babyhood? You have set me thinking. You do not expect me to accept at once all you say. You give me entirely novel views. I shall have to digest them. Will you now explain the epithet prostitute? That you cannot accept my views at once is only right. If you will read the literature on this subject, you will have some idea of it. The parliament is without a real master. Under the prime minister, its movement is not steady, but it is buffeted about like a prostitute. The Prime Minister is more concerned about his power than about the welfare of the Parliament. His energy is concentrated upon securing the success of his party. His care is not always that the Parliament shall do right. Prime Ministers are known to have made the Parliament do things merely for party advantage. All this is worth thinking over. Then you are really attacking the very men whom we have hitherto considered to be patriotic and honest. I can have nothing against prime ministers, but what I have seen leads me to think that they cannot be considered really patriotic. If they are to be considered honest because they do not take what is generally known as bribery, let them be so considered, but they are open to subtler influences. In order to gain their ends, they certainly bribe people with honours. I do not hesitate to say that they have neither real honesty nor a living conscience. As you express these views about the Parliament, I would like to hear you on the English people so that I may have your view of their government. To the English voters, their newspaper is their Bible. They take their cue from their newspapers, which latter are often dishonest. The same fact is differently interpreted by different newspapers according to the party in whose interests they are edited. One newspaper would consider a great Englishman to be a paragon of honesty, another would consider him dishonest. What must be the condition of the people whose newspapers are of this type? You shall describe it. These people change their views frequently. It is said that they change them every seven years. These views swing like the pendulum of a clock and are never steadfast. The people would follow a powerful orator or a man who gives them parties, receptions, etc. As other people, so is their parliament. They have certainly one quality very strongly developed. They will never allow their country to be lost. If any person were to cast an evil eye on it, they would pluck out his eye. But that does not mean that the nation possesses every other virtue or that it should be imitated. If India copies England, it is my firm conviction that she will be ruined. To what do you ascribe this state of England? It is not due to any peculiar fault of the English people, but the condition is due to modern civilization. It is a civilization only in name. Under it, the nations of Europe are becoming degraded and ruined day by day.
Chapter 6 Historical Context Modern Civilization On the eve of writing Hind Swaraj, the question of modern civilization was also worrying Mahatma Gandhi. On the one hand, the colonial administrators behave as if they represent a superior civilization, the modern civilization. On the other hand, the new Indian middle class was behaving as if the colonial administrators were right. Both parties, in Gandhi's view, were profoundly mistaken. In defending the modern state merely as an efficient system of coercive power and nothing more than that, the colonial administrators were doing India a disservice. And in attempting to modernize India on the pattern of England and Japan, the modern middle class was wreaking economic havoc on India's poor and the rural population. What India needed, he stated bluntly, was to unlearn what it had learned in the last 50 years. And what Britain needed to do is to return to its Christian roots and discard modern civilization. Both India and Britain had to reintegrate whatever was humane in modern civilization within the framework of their own respective traditional religions. At such a time as they could accomplish this, and only then, could they do good to their own peoples and to the rest of the world. Colonialism was the fruit of modern civilization, and only when this truth was grasped could the colonial problem find its final solution. Chapter 6 Civilization Now you will have to explain what you mean by civilization. It is not a question of what I mean. Several English writers refuse to call that civilization which passes under that name. Many books have been written upon that subject. Societies have been formed to cure the nation of the evils of civilization. A great English writer has written a work called Civilization, Its Cause and Cure. Therein he has called it a disease. Why do we not know this generally? The answer is very simple. We rarely find people arguing against themselves. Those who are intoxicated by modern civilization are not likely to write against it. Their care will be to find out facts and arguments in support of it. And this they do unconsciously, believing it to be true. A man, whilst he is dreaming, believes in his dream. He is undeceived only when he is awakened from his sleep. A man laboring under the bane of civilization is like a dreaming man. What we usually read are the works of defenders of modern civilization, which undoubtedly claims among its votaries very brilliant and even some very good men. Their writings hypnotize us, and so, one by one, we are drawn into the vortex. This seems to be very plausible. Now will you tell me something of what you have read and thought of the civilization? Let us first consider what state of things is described by the word civilization. Its true test lies in the fact that people living in it make bodily welfare the object of life. We will take some examples. The people of Europe today live in better built homes than they did a hundred years ago. This is considered an emblem of civilization and this is also a matter to promote bodily happiness. Formerly they wore skins and used as their weapons spears. Now they wear long trousers and for embellishing their bodies they wear a variety of clothing and instead of spears they carry with them revolvers containing five or more chambers. 
If people of a certain country who have hitherto not been in the habit of wearing much clothing, boots, etc., adopt European clothing, they are supposed to have become civilized out of savagery. Formerly in Europe, people ploughed their lands mainly by manual labor. Now, one man can plough a vast tract by means of steam engines and can thus amass great wealth. This is called a sign of civilization. Formerly, the fewest men wrote books that were most valuable. Now, anybody writes and prints anything he likes and poison people's mind. Formerly, men travelled in wagons. Now, they fly through the air in trains at the rate of 400 and more miles per day. This is considered the height of civilization. It has been stated that as men progress, they shall be able to travel in airships and reach any part of the world in a few hours. Men will not need the use of their hands and feet. They will press a button and they will have their clothing by their side. They will press another button and they will have their newspaper. A third and a motor car will be in waiting for them. They will have a variety of delicately dished up food. Everything will be done by machinery. Formerly, when people wanted to fight with one another, they measured between them their bodily strength. Now it is possible to take away thousands of lives by one man working behind a gun from a hill. This is civilization. Formerly, men worked in the open air only so much as they liked. Now, thousands of workmen meet together and for the sake of maintenance work in factories or mines. Their condition is worse than that of beasts. They are obliged to work at the risk of their lives at most dangerous occupations for the sake of millionaires. Formerly, men were made slaves under physical compulsion. Now they are enslaved by temptation of money and of the luxuries that money can buy. There are now diseases of which people never dreamt before and an army of doctors is engaged in finding out their cures and so hospitals have increased. This is a test of civilization. Formerly special messengers were required and much expense was incurred in order to send letters. Today anyone can abuse his fellow by means of a letter for one penny. True, at the same cost one can send one's thanks also. Formerly, people had two or three meals consisting of homemade bread and vegetables. Now they require something to eat every two hours, so that they have hardly leisure for anything else. What more need I say? All this you can ascertain from several authoritative books. These are all true tests of civilization. And if anyone speaks to the contrary, know that he is ignorant. This civilization takes note neither of morality nor of religion. Its votaries calmly state that their business is not to teach religion. Some even consider it to be a superstitious growth. Others put on the cloak of religion and prate about morality. But after 20 years experience, I have come to the conclusion that immorality is often taught in the name of morality. Even a child can understand that in all I have described above, there can be no inducement to morality. Civilization seeks to increase bodily comforts and it fails miserably even in doing so. This civilization is irreligion and it has taken such a hold on the people in Europe that those who are in it appear to be half mad. They lack real physical strength or courage. They keep up their energy by intoxication. They can hardly be happy in solitude. Women who should be the queens of households wander in the streets or they slave away in factories. For the sake of a pittance, half a million women in England alone are laboring under trying circumstances in factories or similar institutions this awful fact is one of the causes of the daily growing suffragette movement. This civilization is such that one has only to be patient and it will be self-destroyed. According to the teaching of Muhammad, this would be considered a satanic civilization. Hinduism calls it the Black Age. 
I cannot give you an adequate conception of it. It is eating into the vitals of the English nation. It must be shunned. Parliaments are really emblems of slavery. If you will sufficiently think over this, you will entertain the same opinion and cease to blame the English. They rather deserve our sympathy. They are a shrewd nation and I therefore believe that they will cast off the evil. They are enterprising and industrious and their mode of thought is not inherently immoral. Neither are they bad at heart. I therefore respect them. Civilization is not an incurable disease, but it should never be forgotten that the English people are at present afflicted by it. Chapter 7 Why Was India Lost? have said much about civilization, enough to make me ponder over it. I do not know what I should adopt and why I should avoid the nations of Europe, but one question comes to my lips immediately. If civilization is a disease, and if it has attacked the English nation, why has she been able to take India and why is she able to retain it? Your question is not very difficult to answer and we shall presently be able to examine the true nature of Swaraj, for I am aware that I still have to answer that question. I will, however, take up your previous question. The English have not taken India. We have given it to them. They are not in India because of their strength, but because we keep them. Let us now see whether these propositions can be sustained. They came to our country originally for the purpose of trade. Recall the company Bahadur. Who made it Bahadur? They had not the slightest intention at the time of establishing a kingdom. Who assisted the company's officers? Who was tempted at the sight of their silver? Who bought their goods? History testifies that we did all this. In order to become rich all at once, we welcomed the company's officers with open arms. We assisted them. If I am in the habit of drinking bhang and a seller thereof sells it to me, am I to blame him or myself? By blaming the seller, shall I be able to avoid the habit? And if a particular retailer is driven away, will not another take his place? A true servant of India will have to go to the root of the matter. If an excess of food has caused me indigestion, I will certainly not avoid it by blaming the water. He is a true physician who probes the cause of disease and if you pose as a physician for the disease of India, you will have to find out its true cause. You are right. Now I think you will not have to argue much with me to drive your conclusions home. I am impatient to know your further views. You are now on a most interesting topic. I shall therefore endeavour to follow your thought and stop you when I am in doubt. I am afraid that in spite of your enthusiasm, as we proceed further, we shall have differences of opinion. Nevertheless, I shall argue only when you still stop me. We have already seen that the English merchants were able to get a footing in India because we encouraged them. 
When our princes fought among themselves, they sought the assistance of the company Bahadur. That corporation was versed alike in commerce and war. It was unhampered by questions of morality. Its object was to increase its commerce and to make money. It accepted our assistance and increased the number of its warehouses. To protect the latter, it employed an army which was utilized by us also. Is it not then useless to blame the English for what we did at that time? The Hindus and the Mohammedans were at daggers drawn. This too gave the company its opportunity and thus we created the circumstances that gave the company its control over India. Hence it is truer to say that we gave India to the English than that India was lost. Will you now tell me how they are able to retain India? The causes that gave them India enable them to retain it. Some Englishmen state that they took and they hold India by the sword. Both these statements are wrong. The sword is entirely useless for holding India. We alone cannot keep them. Napoleon is said to have described the English as a nation of shopkeepers. It is a fitting description. They hold whatever dominions they have for the sake of their commerce. Their army and their navy are intended to protect it. When the Transvaal offered no such attractions, the late Mr. Gladstone discovered that it was not right for the English to hold it. When it became a paying proposition, resistance led to war. Mr. Chamberlain soon discovered that England enjoyed a suzerainty over the Transvaal. It is related that someone asked the late President Kruger whether there was gold in the moon. He replied that it was highly unlikely because if there were, the English would have annexed it. Many problems can be solved by remembering that money is their god. Then it follows that we keep the English in India for our base self-interest. We like their commerce, they please us by their subtle methods and get what they want from us. To blame them for this is to perpetuate their power. We further strengthen their hold by quarreling amongst ourselves. If you accept the above statements, it is proved that the English entered India for the purposes of trade. They remain in it for the same purpose and we help them to do so. Their arms and ammunition are perfectly useless. In this connection, I remind you that it is the British flag which is waving in Japan and not the Japanese. The English have a treaty with Japan for the sake of their commerce and you will see that if they can manage it, their commerce will greatly expand in that country. They wish to convert the whole world into a vast market for their goods. That they cannot do so is true. But the blame will not be theirs. They will leave no stone unturned to reach the goal. intimate pictures of Gandhi once more in the limelight as the result of his hunger strike give you an idea of how frail the little Hindu leader was when he began his fast. Aimed at the British, Gandhi's strike was also a protest caused by the caste system under which 60 million untouchables are outlawed by their fellow Hindus. Gandhi wants to include the untouchables in a united native India, but even if he does, there are the 77 million Mohammedans who oppose Hindu control. Chapter 8. The Condition of India
I now understand why the English hold India. I should like to know your views about the condition of our country. It is a sad condition. In thinking of it, my eyes water and my throat gets parched. I have grave doubts whether I shall be able sufficiently to explain what is in my heart. It is my deliberate opinion that India is being ground down not under the English heel but under that of modern civilization. It is groaning under the monster's terrible weight. There is yet time to escape it but every day makes it more and more difficult. Religion is dear to me and my first complaint is that India is becoming irreligious. Here I am not thinking of the Hindu, the Mohammedan or the Zoroastrian religion, but of that religion which underlies all religions. We are turning away from God. How so? There is a charge laid against us that we are a lazy people and that the Europeans are industrious and enterprising. We have accepted the charge and we therefore wish to change our condition. Hinduism, Islamism, Zoroastrianism, Christianity and all other religions teach that we should remain passive about worldly pursuits and active about godly pursuits, that we should set a limit to our worldly ambition and that our religious ambition should be illimitable. Our activity should be directed into the latter channel. You seem to be encouraging religious charlatanism. Many a cheat has by talking in a similar strain led the people astray. You are bringing an unlawful charge against religion. Humbug there undoubtedly is about all religions. Where there is light there is also shadow. I am prepared to maintain that humbugs in worldly matters are far worse than humbugs in religion. The humbug of civilization that I endeavor to show to you is not to be found in religion. How can you say that? In the name of religion, Hindus and Mohammedans fought against one another. For the same cause Christians fought Christians. Thousands of innocent men have been murdered, thousands have been burned and tortured in its name. Surely this is much worse than any civilization. I certainly submit that the above hardships are far more bearable than those of civilization. Everybody understands that the cruelties you have named are not part of religion although they have been practiced in its name. Therefore, there is no aftermath to these cruelties. They will always happen so long as there are to be found ignorant and credulous people. But there is no end to the victims destroyed in the fire of civilization. Its deadly effect is that people come under its scorching flames believing it to be all good. They become utterly irreligious and in reality derive little advantage from the world. Civilization is like a mouse gnawing while it is soothing us. When its full effect is realized, we will see that religious superstition is harmless compared to that of modern civilization. I am not pleading for a continuance of religious superstitions. We will certainly fight them tooth and nail. But we can never do so by disregarding religion. We can only do so by appreciating and conserving the latter. Then will you contend that the Pax Britannica is a useless encumbrance? You may see peace if you like. I see none. You make light of the terror that the thugs, the pindaris, the bheels were to the country? If you will give the matter some thought, you will see that the terror was by no means such a mighty thing. If it had been a very substantial thing, the other people would have died away before the English advent. Moreover, the present peace is only nominal, for by it we have become emasculated and cowardly. We are not to assume that the English have changed the nature of the Pindaris and the Bhils. It is therefore better to suffer the Pindari peril than that someone else should protect us from it and thus render us effeminate. I should prefer to be killed by the arrow of a bill than to seek unmanly protection. India without such protection was an India full of valor. Macaulay betrayed 
gross ignorance when he libeled Indians as being practically cowards. They never merited the charge. Cowards living in a country inhabited by hardy mountaineers infested by wolves and tigers must surely find an early grave. Have you ever visited our fields? I assure you that our agriculturists sleep fearlessly on their farms even today and the English, you and I, would hesitate to sleep where they sleep. Strength lies in absence of fear, not in the quantity of flesh and muscle we may have on our bodies. Moreover, I must remind you who desire home rule that after all, the Bhils, the Pindaris, the Assamese and the Thugs are our own countrymen. To conquer them is your and my work. So long as we fear our own brethren, we are unfit to reach that goal. Chapter 9 The Condition of India Continued Railways You have deprived me of the consolation I used to have regarding peace in India. I have merely given you my opinion on the religious aspect. But when I give you my views as to the poverty of India, you will perhaps begin to dislike me because what you and I have hitherto considered beneficial for India no longer appears to me to be so. What may that be? Railways, Lawyers and doctors have impoverished the country so much so that if we do not wake up in time, we shall be ruined. I do now indeed fear that we are not likely to agree at all. You are attacking the very institutions which we have hitherto considered to be good. It is necessary to exercise patience. The true inwardness of the evils of civilization you will understand with difficulty. Doctors assure us that a consumptive clings to life even when he is about to die. Consumption does not produce apparent hurt. It even produces a seductive color about a patient's face so as to induce the belief that all is well. Civilization is such a disease and we have to be very wary. Very well then, I shall hear you on the railways. It must be manifest to you that but for the railways, the English could not have such a hold on India as they have. The railways too have spread the bubonic plague. Without them, masses could not move from place to place. They are the carriers of plague germs. Formerly, we had natural segregation. Railways have also increased the frequency of famines because owing to facility of means of locomotion, people sell out their grain and it is sent to the dearest markets. People become careless and so the pressure of famine increases. They accentuate the evil nature of man. Bad men fulfill their evil designs with greater rapidity. The holy places of India have become unholy. Formerly, people went to those places with great difficulty. Generally, therefore, only the real devotees visited such places. Nowadays, rogues visit them in order to practice their roguery. You have given a one-sided account. Good men can visit these places as well as bad men. Why do they not take the fullest advantage of the railways? Good travels at a snail's pace. It can therefore have little to do with the railways. 
Those who want to do good are not selfish. They are not in a hurry. They know that to impregnate people with good requires a long time. But evil has wings. To build a house takes time. Its destruction takes none. So the railways can become a distributing agency for the evil one only. It may be a debatable matter whether railways spread famines, but it is beyond dispute that they propagate evil. Be that as it may, all the disadvantages of railways are more than counterbalanced by the fact that it is due to them that we see in India the new spirit of nationalism. I hold this to be a mistake. The English have taught us that we were not one nation before and that it will require centuries before we become one nation. This is without foundation. We were one nation before they came to India. One thought inspired us. Our mode of life was the same. It was because we were one nation that we were able to establish one kingdom. Subsequently, they divided us. This requires an explanation. I do not wish to suggest that because we were one nation, we had no differences. But it is submitted that our leading men traveled throughout India either on foot or in bullock carts. They learned one another's languages and there was no aloofness between them. What do you think could have been the intention of those far-seeing ancestors of ours who established Sweta Bindu Rameshwar in the south, Jagannath in the southeast and Hardwar in the north as places of pilgrimage? You will admit that they were no fools. They knew that worship of God could have been performed just as well at home. They taught us that those whose hearts were aglow with righteousness had the Ganges in their own homes. But they saw that India was one undivided land, so made by nature. They therefore argued that it must be one nation. Arguing thus, they established holy places in various parts of India and fired the people with an idea of nationality in a manner unknown to other parts of the world. Any two Indians are one as no two Englishmen are. Only you and I and others who consider ourselves civilized and superior persons imagine that we are many nations. It was after the advent of railways that we began to believe in distinctions and you are at liberty now to say that it is through the railways that we are beginning to abolish those distinctions. An opium eater may argue the advantage of opium eating from the fact that he began to understand the evil of opium habit after having eaten it. I would ask you to consider well what I have said on the railways. I will gladly do so. But one question occurs to me even now. You have described to me the India of the pre-Mohammedan period. But now we have the Mohammedans, Parsis and Christians. How can they be one nation? Hindus and Mohammedans are old enemies. Our very proverbs prove it. Mohammedans turn to the west for worship, whilst Hindus turn to the east. The former look down on Hindus as idolaters. The Hindus worship the cow, the Mohammedans kill her. The Hindus believe in the doctrine of non-killing, the Mohammedans do not. We thus meet with differences at every step. How can India be one nation? Chapter 10 Historical Context The Indian Muslim Gandhi's South African experience had given him a deep insight into the peculiar problems that Indian Muslims faced in a pluralist society such as India. He had worked in close harmony with Muslim leaders in all his South African campaigns. On both his London trips, he was accompanied by Muslim leaders of the Indian community. 
Given this background, Gandhi had no reason to think that Indian Muslims would turn away from the general direction that Indian nationalism was taking. His conceptions of nationalism and Swaraj, he believed, were neutral as far as religion as sect was concerned. His vision of politics as it emerges in 1909 saw Indians as primarily members of a single nation, Praja, and only secondarily as members of a sect or a caste or a religion. Indians whose humanity would be strong enough to enable them to tolerate difference within the context of a deeper national identity. According to Hind Swaraj, a major obstacle to Indian self-government is the sectarian nationalism fostered by certain sections of both Muslims and Hindus. The solution to this evil lies in the development of a moderate liberal nationalism based on the concept of Praja, reintroduced into the political vocabulary by Hind Swaraj. In an effort to free religion of the evil of sectarianism, Gandhi introduces his famous distinction between religion as organization and religion as ethics and spirituality. Underlying all organized religions, there is a universal ethic and spirituality which teaches the unconditional love of God and the neighbor. At the same time, religion as organization serves as a convenient means of maintaining a certain type of pre-political identity and as a means of reaching certain much-yearned-for spiritual ends. As such, every organized religion has legitimacy. It follows that organized religions ought to practice toleration towards each other. Hinswara teaches that there are good religious reasons for practicing toleration. Chapter 10 The Condition of India Continued The Hindus and the Mohammedans Your last question is a serious one, and yet on careful consideration it will be found as to be easy of solution. The question arises because of the presence of the railways, of the lawyers and of the doctors. We shall presently examine the last two. We have already considered the railways. I should however like to add that man is so made by nature as to require him to restrict his movements as far as his hands and feet will take him. If we did not rush about from place to place by means of railways and such other maddening conveniences, much of the confusion that arises would be obviated. Our difficulties are of our own creation. God set a limit to man's locomotive ambition in the construction of his body. Man immediately proceeded to discover means of overriding the limit. God gifted man with intellect that he might know his maker. Man abused it so that he might forget his maker. I am so constructed that I can only serve my immediate neighbors, but in my conceit I pretend to have discovered that I must with my body serve every individual in the universe. In thus attempting the impossible, man comes in contact with different natures, different religions, and is utterly confounded. According to this reasoning, it must be apparent to you that railways are a most dangerous institution. Man has thereto gone further away from his maker. But I am impatient to hear your answer to my question. Has the introduction of Mohammedanism not unmade the nation? 
India cannot cease to become one nation because people belonging to different religions live in it. The introduction of foreigners does not necessarily destroy the nation. They merge in it. A country is one nation only when such a condition obtains in it. That country must have a faculty for assimilation. India has ever been such a country. In reality, there are as many religions as there are individuals, but those who are conscious of the spirit of nationality do not interfere with one another's religion. If they do, they are not fit to be considered a nation. If the Hindus believe that India should be peopled only by Hindus, they are living in dreamland. The Hindus, the Mohammedans, the Parsis and the Christians who have made India their country are fellow countrymen and they will have to live in unity if only for their own interest. In no part of the world are one nationality and one religion synonymous terms, nor has it ever been so in India. But what about the inborn enmity between the Hindus and Mohammedans? That phrase has been invented by our mutual enemy. When the Hindus and Mohammedans fought against one another, they certainly spoke in that strain. They have long since ceased to fight. How then can there be any inborn enmity? Pray remember this too, that we did not cease to fight only after British occupation. The Hindus flourished under Muslim sovereigns and Muslims under the Hindus. Each party recognized that mutual fighting was suicidal and that neither party would abandon its religion by force of arms. Both parties therefore decided to live in peace. With the English advent, the quarrels recommenced. The proverbs you have quoted were coined when both were fighting. To quote them now is obviously harmful. Should we not remember that many Hindus and Mohammedans own the same ancestors and the same blood runs through their veins? Do people become enemies because they change their religion? Is the God of the Mohammedan different from the God of the Hindu? Religions are different roads converging to the same point. What does it matter that we can take different roads so long as we reach the same goal? Wherein is the cause for quarrelling? Moreover, there are deadly proverbs as between the followers of Shiva and those of Vishnu, yet nobody suggests that these two do not belong to the same nation. It is said that the Vedic religion is different from Jainism, but the followers of the respective faiths are not different nations. The fact is that we have become enslaved and therefore quarrel and like to have our quarrels decided by a third party. There are Hindu iconoclasts as there are Mohammedan. The more we advance in true knowledge, the better we shall understand that we need not be at war with those whose religion we may not follow. Now I would like to know your views about cow protection. I myself respect the cow, that is, I look upon her with affectionate reverence. The cow is the protector of India because it, being an agricultural country, is dependent on the cow's progeny. She is a most useful animal in hundreds of ways. Our Mohammedan brethren will admit that. But just as I respect the cow, so do I respect my fellow man. A man is just as useful as a cow, no matter whether he be Mohammedan or a Hindu. Am I then to fight with or kill a Mohammedan in order to save a cow? In doing so, I would become an enemy as well of the cow as of the Mohammedan. Therefore, the only method I know of protecting the cow is that I should approach my Mohammedan brother and urge him for the sake of the country to join me in protecting her. If he would not listen to me, I should let the cow go for the simple reason that the matter is beyond my ability. If I were overfull of pity for the cow, I should sacrifice my life to save her, but not take my brothers. This I hold is the law of our religion. When men become obstinate, it is a difficult thing. If I pull one way, my Muslim brother will pull another. If I put on a superior air, 
he will return the compliment. If I bow to him gently, he will do it much more so, and if he does not, I shall not be considered to have done wrong in having bowed. When the Hindus became insistent, the killing of cows increased. In my opinion, cow protection societies may be considered cow killing societies. It is a disgrace to us that we should need such societies. When we forget how to protect cows, I suppose we needed such societies. What am I to do when a blood brother is on the point of killing a cow? Am I to kill him or to fall down at his feet and implore him? If you admit that I should adopt the latter course, I must do the same to my Muslim brother. Who protects the cow from destruction by Hindus when they cruelly ill-treat her? Whoever reasons with the Hindus when they mercilessly belabor the progeny of the cow with their sticks. But this has not prevented us from remaining one nation. Lastly, if it be true that the Hindus believe in the doctrine of non-killing and the Mohammedans do not, what I pray is the duty of the former. It is not written that a follower of the religion of Ahimsa, non-killing, may kill a fellow man. For him the way is straight. In order to save one being, he may not kill another. He can only plead. Therein lies his sole duty. But does every Hindu believe in Ahimsa? Going to the root of the matter, not one man really practices such a religion, because we do destroy life. We are said to follow that religion because we want to obtain freedom from liability to kill any kind of life. Generally speaking, we may observe that many Hindus partake of meat and are not therefore followers of Ahimsa. It is therefore preposterous to suggest that the two cannot live together amicably because the Hindus believe in Ahimsa and the Mohammedans do not. These thoughts are put into our minds by selfish and false religious teachers. The English put the finishing touch. They have a habit of writing history. They pretend to study the manners and customs of all peoples. God has given us a limited mental capacity, but they usurp the function of the Godhead and indulge in novel experiments. They write about their own researches in most laudatory terms and hypnotize us into believing them. We, in our ignorance, then fall at their feet. Those who do not wish to misunderstand things may read up the Quran and will find therein hundreds of passages acceptable to the Hindus, and the Bhagavad Gita contains passages to which not a Mohammedan can take exception. Am I to dislike a Mohammedan because there are passages in the Quran I do not understand or like? It takes two to make a quarrel. If I do not want to quarrel with a Mohammedan, the latter will be powerless to foist a quarrel on me, and similarly, I should be powerless if a Mohammedan refuses his assistance to quarrel with me. An arm striking the air will become disjointed. If everyone will try to understand the core of his own religion and adhere to it and will not allow false teachers to dictate to him, there will be no room left for quarreling. But will the English ever allow the two bodies to join hands? This question arises out of your timidity. It betrays our shallowness. If two brothers want to live in peace, is it possible for a third party to separate them? If they were to listen to evil counsels, we would consider them to be foolish. Similarly, we Hindus and Mohammedans would have to blame our folly rather than the English if we allowed them to put us asunder. A clay pot would break through impact, if not with one stone, then with another. The way to save the pot is not to keep it away from the danger point, but to bake it so that no stone would break it. We have then to make our hearts of perfectly baked clay. Then we shall be steeled against all danger. This can be easily done by the Hindus. They are superior in numbers. They pretend that they are more educated. 
They are therefore better able to shield themselves from attack on their amicable relations with the Mohammedans. There is mutual distrust between the two communities. The Mohammedans therefore ask for certain concessions from Lord Morley. Why should the Hindus oppose this? If the Hindus desisted, the English would notice it. The Mohammedans would gradually begin to trust the Hindus and brotherliness would be the outcome. We should be ashamed to take our quarrels to the English. Everyone can find out for himself that the Hindus can lose nothing by desisting. That man who has inspired confidence in another has never lost anything in this world. I do not suggest that the Hindus and Mohammedans will never fight. Two brothers living together often do so. We shall sometimes have our heads broken. Such a thing ought not to be necessary, but all men are not equi-minded. When people are in a rage, they do many foolish things. That we have to put up with. But when we do quarrel, we certainly do not want to engage counsel and to resort to English or any law courts. Two men fight, both have their heads broken, or one only. How shall a third party distribute justice amongst them? Those who fight may expect to be injured. Chapter 11 The Condition of India Continued Lawyers tell me that when two men quarrel, they should not go to a law court? This is astonishing. Whether you call it astonishing or not, it is the truth. And your question introduces us to the lawyers and the doctors. My firm opinion is that the lawyers have enslaved India and that they have accentuated the hindu Mohammedan dissensions and have confirmed English authority. It is easy enough to bring these charges, but it will be difficult for you to prove them. But for the lawyers, who would have shown us the road to independence? Who would have protected the poor? Who would have secured justice? For instance, the late Mr. Manmohan Ghosh defended many a poor man free of charge. The Congress, which you have praised so much, is dependent for its existence and activity upon the work of the lawyers. To denounce such an estimable class of men is to spell justice injustice. And you are abusing the liberty of the press by decrying lawyers. At one time, I used to think exactly like you. I have no desire to convince you that they have never done a single good thing. I honor Mr. Ghosh's memory. It is quite true that he helped the poor. That the Congress owes the lawyers something is believable. Lawyers are also men, and there is something good in every man. Whenever instances of lawyers having done good can be brought forward, it will be found that the good is due to them as men rather than as lawyers. All I am concerned with is to show you that the profession teaches immorality. It is exposed to temptations for which few are saved. The Hindus and the Mohammedans have quarreled. An ordinary man will ask them to forget all about it. He will tell them that both must be more or less at fault and will advise them no longer to quarrel. They go to lawyers. 
The latter's duty is to side with their clients and to find out ways and arguments in favor of the clients to which they, the clients, are often strangers. If they do not do so, they will be considered to have degraded their profession. The lawyers, therefore, will as a rule advance quarrels instead of repressing them. Moreover, men take up that profession not in order to help others out of their miseries, but to enrich themselves. It is one of the avenues of becoming wealthy and their interest exists in multiplying disputes. It is within my knowledge that they are glad when men have disputes. Petty pleaders actually manufacture them. Their touts, like so many leeches, suck the blood of the poor people. Lawyers are men who have little to do. Lazy people, in order to indulge in luxuries, take up such professions. This is a true statement. Any other argument is a mere pretension. It is the lawyers who have discovered that theirs is an honorable profession. They frame laws as they frame their own praises. They decide what fees they will charge and they put on so much side that poor people almost consider them to be heaven-born. Why do they want more fees than common laborers? Why are their requirements greater? In what way are they more profitable to the country than the laborers? Are those who do good entitled to greater payment? And if they have done anything for the country for the sake of money, how shall it be counted as good? Those who know anything of the Hindu Mohammedan quarrels know that they have been often due to the intervention of lawyers. Some families have been ruined through them. They have made brothers enemies, principalities having come under lawyer power have become loaded with debt. Many have been robbed of their all. Such instances can be multiplied. But the greater injury they have done to the country is they have tightened the English grip. Do you think that it would be possible for the English to carry on their government without the law courts? It is wrong to consider that courts are established for the benefit of the people. Those who want to perpetuate their power do so through the courts. If people were to settle their own quarrels, a third party would not be able to exercise any authority over them. Truly, men were less unmanly when they settled their disputes either by fighting or by asking their relatives to decide upon them. They became more unmanly and cowardly when they resorted to the courts of law. It was a sign of savagery when they settled their disputes by fighting. Is it any the less so if I ask a third party to decide between you and me? Surely the decision of a third party is not always right. The parties alone know who is right. We, in our simplicity and ignorance, imagine that a stranger, by taking our money, gives us justice. The chief thing, however, to be remembered is that without lawyers, courts could not have been established or conducted, and without the latter, the English could not rule. Supposing that there were only English judges, English pleaders, and English police, they could only rule over the English. The English could not do without Indian judges and Indian pleaders. How the pleaders were made in the first instance and how they were favored, you should understand well. Then you will have the same abhorrence for the profession that I have. If pleaders were to abandon their profession and consider it just as degrading as prostitution, English rule would break up in a day. They have been instrumental in having the charge laid against us that we love quarrels and courts as fish love water. What I have said with reference to the pleaders necessarily applies to the judges. They are first cousins and the one gives strength to the other.
Chapter 12 The Condition of India Continued Doctors I now understand the lawyers. The good they may have done is accidental. I feel that the profession is certainly hateful. You, however, drag in the doctors also. How is that? The views I submit to you are those I have adopted. They are not original. Western writers have used stronger terms regarding both lawyers and doctors. One writer has likened the whole modern system to the upas tree. Its branches are represented by parasitical professions, including those of law and medicine. And over the trunk has been raised the axe of true religion. Immorality is the root of the tree. So you will see that the views do not come right out of my mind, but they represent the combined experiences of many. I was at one time a great lover of the medical profession. It was my intention to become a doctor for the sake of the country. <laughs> I no longer hold that opinion. I now understand why the medicine men, the Vads among us, have not occupied a very honorable status. The English have certainly effectively used the medical profession for holding us English physicians are known to have used the profession with several Asiatic potentates for political gain. Doctors have almost unhinged us. Sometimes I think that quacks are better than highly qualified doctors. Let us consider. The business of a doctor is to take care of the body or properly speaking, not even that. Their business is really to rid the body of diseases that may afflict it. How do these diseases arise? Surely by our negligence or indulgence. I overeat, I have indigestion, I go to a doctor, he gives me medicine, I am cured, I overeat again and I take his pills again. Had I not taken the pills in the first instance, I would have suffered the punishment deserved by me and I would not have overeaten again. The doctor intervened and helped me to indulge myself. My body thereby certainly felt more at ease, but my mind became weakened. A continuance of a course of a medicine must therefore result in loss of control over the mind. I have indulged in vice, I contract a disease, a doctor cures me. The odds are that I shall repeat the vice. Had the doctor not intervened, nature would have done its work and I would have acquired mastery over myself, would have been freed from vice and would have become happy. Hospitals are institutions for propagating sin. Men take less care of their bodies and immorality increases. European doctors are the worst of all. For the sake of a mistaken care of the human body, they kill annually thousands of animals. They practice vivisection. No religion sanctions this. All say that it is not necessary to take so many lives for the sake of our bodies. These doctors violate our religious instinct. Most of their medical preparations contain either animal fat or spirituous liquors. Both of these are tabooed by Hindus and Mohammedans. We may pretend to be civilized, call religious prohibitions a superstition and wantonly indulge in what we like. The fact remains that the doctors induce us to indulge and the result is that we have become deprived of self-control and have become effeminate. In these circumstances, we are unfit to serve the country. To study European medicine is to deepen our slavery. It is worth considering why we take up the profession of medicine. It is certainly not taken up for the purpose of serving humanity. 
we become doctors so that we may obtain honors and riches. I have endeavored to show that there is no real service of humanity in the profession and that it is injurious to mankind. Doctors make a show of their knowledge and charge exorbitant fees. Their preparations, which are intrinsically worth a few pennies, cost shillings. The populace, in its credulity and in the hope of ridding itself of some disease, allows itself to be cheated. Are not quacks then, whom we know, better than the doctors who put on an air of humaneness? Chapter 13 What is True Civilization? You have denounced railways, lawyers and doctors. I can see that you will discard all machinery. What then is civilization? The answer to that question is not difficult. I believe that the civilization India has evolved is not to be beaten in the world. Nothing can equal the seeds sown by our ancestors. Rome went, Greece shared the same fate. The might of the pharaohs was broken. Japan has become westernized. Of China, nothing can be said. But India is still somehow or the other sound at the foundation. The people of Europe learn their lessons from the writings of the men of Greece or Rome, which exist no longer in their former glory. In trying to learn from them, the Europeans imagine that they will avoid the mistakes of Greece and Rome. Such is their pitiable condition. In the midst of all this, India remains immovable and that is her glory. It is a charge against India that her people are so uncivilized, ignorant and stolid that it is not possible to induce them to adopt any changes. It is a charge really against our merit. What we have tested and found true on the anvil of experience, we dare not change. Many thrust their advice upon India and she remains steady. This is her beauty. It is the sheet anchor of our hope. Civilization is that mode of conduct which points out to man the path of duty. Performance of duty and observance of morality are convertible terms. To observe morality is to attain mastery over our mind and our passions. So doing, we know ourselves. The Gujarati equivalent for civilization means good conduct. If this definition be correct, then India, as so many writers have shown, has nothing to learn from anybody else and this is as it should be. We notice that mind is a restless bird. The more it gets, the more it wants and still remains unsatisfied. The more we indulge our passions, the more unbridled they become. Our ancestors therefore set a limit to our indulgences. They saw that happiness was largely a mental condition. A man is not necessarily happy because he is rich or unhappy because he is poor. The rich are often seen to be unhappy, the poor to be happy. Millions will always remain poor. Observing all this, our ancestors dissuaded us from luxuries and pleasures. We have managed with the same kind of plough as it existed thousands of years ago. 
We have retained the same kind of cottages that we had in former times and our indigenous education remains the same as before. We have had no system of life corroding competition. Each followed his own occupation or trade and charged a regulation wage. It was not that we did not know how to invent machinery, but our forefathers knew that if we set our hearts after such things, we would become slaves and lose our moral fiber. They therefore, after due deliberation, decided that we should only do what we could do with our hands and feet. They saw that our real happiness and health consisted in a proper use of our hands and feet. They further reasoned that large cities were a snare and a useless encumbrance and that people would not be happy in them, that there would be gangs of thieves and robbers, prostitution and vice flourishing in them, and that poor men would be robbed by rich men. They were therefore satisfied with small villages. They saw that kings and their swords were inferior to the sword of ethics, and they therefore held the sovereigns of the earth to be inferior to the rishis and the fakirs. A nation with a constitution like this is fitter to teach others than to learn from others. This nation had courts, lawyers and doctors, but they were all within bounds. Everybody knew that these professions were not particularly superior. Moreover, these vakils and vads did not rob people. They were considered people's dependents, not their masters. Justice was tolerably fair. The ordinary rule was to avoid courts. There were no touts to lure people into them. This evil too was noticeable only in and around capitals. The common people lived independently and followed their agricultural occupation. They enjoyed true home rule. And where this cursed modern civilization has not reached, India remains as it was before. The inhabitants of that part of India will very properly laugh at your newfangled notions. The English do not rule over them, nor will you ever rule over them. Those in whose name we speak we do not know, nor do they know us. I would certainly advise you and those like you who love the motherland to go into the interior that has not yet been polluted by the railways and to live there for six months. You might then be patriotic and speak of home rule. Now you see what I consider to be real civilization. Those who want to change conditions such as I have described are enemies of the country and are sinners. It would be all right if India were exactly as you have described it. But it is also India where there are hundreds of child widows, where two-year-old babies are married, where twelve-year-old girls are mothers and housewives, where women practice polyandry, where the practice of neog obtains where in the name of religion girls dedicate themselves to prostitution and where in the name of religion sheep and goats are killed. Do you consider these also symbols of the civilization that you have described? You make a mistake. The defects that you have shown are defects. Nobody mistakes them for ancient civilization. They remain in spite of it. Attempts have always been made and will be made to remove them. We may utilize the new spirit that is born in us for purging ourselves of these evils. But what I have described to you as emblems of modern civilization are accepted as such by its votaries. The Indian civilization as described by me has been so described by its votaries. In no part of the world and under no civilization have all men attained perfection. The tendency of Indian civilization is to elevate the moral being. That of the Western civilization is to propagate immorality. The latter is godless, the former is based on a belief in God. So understanding and so believing, it behoves every lover of India to cling to the old Indian civilization even as a child clings to its mother's breast.
would you be prepared to die in the cause of India's independence? It is a bad question. Hind Swaraj, Chapter 14 How Can India Become Free? I appreciate your views about civilization. I will have to think over them. I cannot take it in all at once. What then holding the views you do would you suggest for freeing India? I do not expect my views to be accepted all of a sudden. My duty is to place them before readers like yourself. Time can be trusted to do the rest. We have already examined the conditions for freeing India, but we have done so indirectly. We will now do so directly. It is a world-known maxim that the removal of the cause of a disease results in the removal of the disease itself. Similarly, if the cause of India's slavery be removed, India can become free. If Indian civilization is, as you say, the best of all, how do you account for India's slavery? This civilization is unquestionably the best, but it is to be observed that all civilizations have been on their trial. That civilization which is permanent outlives it. Because the sons of India were found wanting, its civilization has been placed in jeopardy. But its strength is to be seen in its ability to survive the shock. Moreover, the whole of India is not touched. Those alone who have been affected by Western civilization have become enslaved. We measure the universe by our own miserable foot rule. When we are slaves, we believe that the whole universe is enslaved. Because we are in an abject condition, we think that the whole of India is in that condition. As a matter of fact, it is not so, but it is as well to impute our slavery to the whole of India. But if we bear in mind the above fact, we can see that if we become free, India is free. And in this thought, you have a definition of Swaraj. It is Swaraj when we learn to rule ourselves. It is, therefore, in the palm of our hands. Do not consider this Swaraj to be like a dream. Here, there is no idea of sitting still. The Swaraj that I wish to picture before you and me is such that after we have once realized it, we will endeavor to the end of our lifetime to persuade others to do likewise. But such Swaraj has to be experienced by each one for himself. One drowning man will never save another. Slaves ourselves, it would be a mere pretension to think of freeing others. Now you will have seen that it is not necessary for us to have as our goal the expulsion of the English. If the English become Indianized, we can accommodate them. If they wish to remain in India along with their civilization, there is no room for them. It lies with us to bring about such a state of things. It is impossible that Englishmen should ever become Indianized. To say that is the equivalent of saying that they have no humanity in them. And it is really beside the point whether they become so or not. If we keep our own house in order, only those who are fit to live in it will remain. Others will leave of their own accord. Such things occur within the experience of all of us. But it has not occurred in history. To believe that what has not occurred in history will not occur at all is to argue disbelief in the dignity of man. At any rate, it behoves us to try what appeals to our reason. All countries are not similarly conditioned. The condition of India is unique. Its strength is immeasurable. We need not therefore refer to the history of other countries. 
I have drawn attention to the fact that when other civilizations have succumbed, the Indian has survived many a shock. I cannot follow this. There seems little doubt that we shall have to expel the English by force of arms. So long as they are in the country, we cannot rest. One of our poets says that slaves cannot even dream of happiness. We are day by day becoming weakened owing to the presence of the English. Our greatness is gone. Our people look like terrified men. The English are in the country like a blight which we must remove by every means. In your excitement, you have forgotten all we have been considering. We brought the English and we keep them. Why do you forget that our adoption of their civilization makes their presence in India at all possible? Your hatred against them ought to be transferred to their civilization. But let us assume that we have to drive away the English by fighting. How is that to be done? In the same way as Italy did it. What it was possible for Mazzini and Garibaldi to do is possible for us. You cannot deny that they were very great men. Chapter 15 Italy and India It is well that you have instanced Italy. Mazzini was a great and good man. Garibaldi was a great warrior. Both are adorable. From their lives we can learn much. But the condition of Italy was different from that of India. In the first instance, the difference between Mazzini and Garibaldi is worth noting. Mazzini's ambition was not and has not yet been realized regarding Italy. Mazzini has shown in his writings on the duty of man that every man must learn how to rule himself. This has not happened in Italy. Garibaldi did not hold this view of Mazzini's. Garibaldi gave and every Italian took arms. Italy and Austria had the same civilization. They were cousins in this respect. It was a matter of tit for tat. Garibaldi simply wanted Italy to be free from the Austrian yoke. The machinations of Minister Cavour disgrace that portion of the history of Italy. And what has been the result? If you believe that because Italians rule Italy, the Italian nation is happy, you are groping in darkness. Mazzini has shown conclusively that Italy did not become free. Victor Emmanuel gave one meaning to the expression. Mazzini gave another. According to Emmanuel, Cavour and even Garibaldi, Italy meant the king of Italy and his henchmen. According to Mazzini, it meant the whole of the Italian people, that is, its agriculturalists. Emmanuel was only its servant. The Italy of Mazzini still remains in a state of slavery. At the time of the so-called National War, it was a game of chess between two rival kings with the people of Italy as pawns. The working classes in that land are still unhappy. They therefore indulge in assassination, rise in revolt and rebellion on their part is always expected. What substantial gain did Italy obtain after the withdrawal of the Austrian troops? The gain was only nominal. The reforms for the sake of which the war was supposed to have been undertaken have not yet been granted. The condition of the people in general still remains the same. I am sure you do not wish to reproduce such a condition in India. 
I believe that you want the millions of India to be happy, not that you want the reins of government in your hands. If that be so, we have to consider only one thing. How can the millions obtain self-rule? You will admit that people under several Indian princes are being ground down. The latter mercilessly crush them. Their tyranny is greater than that of the English. And if you want such tyranny in India, then we shall never agree. My patriotism does not teach that I am to allow people to be crushed under the heel of Indian princes, if only the English retire. If I have the power, I should resist the tyranny of Indian princes just as much as that of the English. By patriotism, I mean the welfare of the whole people, and if I could secure it at the hands of the English, I should bow down my head to them. If any Englishman dedicated his life to securing the freedom of India, resisting tyranny and serving the land, I should welcome that Englishman as an Indian. Again, India can fight like Italy only when she has arms. You have not considered this problem at all. The English are splendidly armed. That does not frighten me, but it is clear that to pit ourselves against them in arms, thousands of Indians must be armed. If such a thing be possible, how many years will it take? Moreover, to arm India on a large scale is to Europeanize it. Then her condition will be just as pitiable as that of Europe. This means, in short, that India must accept European civilization, and if that is what we want, the best thing is that we have among us those who are so well trained in that civilization. We will then fight for a few rights, we will get what we can, and so pass our days. But the fact is that the Indian nation will not adopt arms, and it is well that it does not. You are over assuming facts. All need not be armed. At first, we will assassinate a few Englishmen and strike terror. Then, a few men who will have been armed will fight openly. We may have to lose a quarter of a million men, more or less, but we will regain our land. We will undertake guerrilla warfare and defeat the English. That is to say, you want to make the holy land of India unholy. Do you not tremble to think of freeing India by assassination? What we need to do is to kill ourselves. It is a cowardly thought, that of killing others. Whom do you suppose to free by assassination? The millions of India do not desire it. Those who are intoxicated by the wretched modern civilization think these things. Those who will rise to power by murder will certainly not make the nation happy. Those who believe that India has gained by Dhingra's act and such other acts in India make a serious mistake. Dhingra was a patriot, but his love was blind. He gave his body in a wrong way. Its ultimate result can only be mischievous. But you will admit that the English have been frightened by these murders and that Lord Morley's reforms are due to fear. The English are both a timid and a brave nation. She is, I believe, easily influenced by the use of gunpowder. It is possible that Lord Morley has granted the reforms through fear, but what is granted under fear can be retained only so long as the fear lasts. myself as a soldier, though a soldier of peace. I know the value of discipline and truth. I must ask you to believe me when I say that I have never made a statement of this description, that the masses of India 
if it became necessary, would resort to violence. I regard myself as incapable in my lucid moments of, having, uh, of making a statement of this character. It is complete independence that we want. Chapter 16 Brute Force This is a new doctrine, that what is gained through fear is retained only while the fear lasts. Surely what is given will not be withdrawn? Not so. The proclamation of 1857 was given at the end of a revolt and for the purpose of preserving peace. When peace was secured and people became simple-minded, its full effect was toned down. If I cease stealing for fear of punishment, I would recommence the operation so soon as the fear is withdrawn from me. This is almost a universal experience. We have assumed that we can get men to do things by force and therefore we use force. Will you not admit that you are arguing against yourself? You know that what the English obtained in their own country, they have obtained by using brute force. I know you have argued that what they have obtained is useless, but that does not affect my argument. They wanted useless things and they got them. My point is that their desire was fulfilled. What does it matter what means they adopted? Why should we not obtain our goal, which is good, by any means whatsoever, even by using violence? Shall I think of the means when I have to deal with a thief in the house? My duty is to drive him out anyhow. You seem to admit that we have received nothing and that we shall receive nothing by petitioning. Why then may we not do so by using brute force? And to retain what we may receive, we shall keep up the fear by using the same force to the extent that it may be necessary. You will not find fault with a continuance of force to prevent a child from thrusting its foot into fire, somehow or the other, we have to gain our end. Your reasoning is plausible. It has deluded many. I have similar arguments before now. But I think I know better now and I shall endeavor to undeceive you. Let us first take the argument that we are justified in gaining our end by using brute force because the English gained theirs by using similar means. It is perfectly true that they used brute force and that it is possible for us to do likewise, but by using similar means we can only get the same thing that they got. You will admit that we do not want that. Your belief that there is no connection between the means and the end is a great mistake. Through that mistake, even men who have been considered religious have committed grievous crimes. Your reasoning is the same as saying that we can get a rose through planting a noxious weed. If I want to cross the ocean, I can do so only by means of a vessel. If I were to use a cart for that purpose, both the cart and I would soon find the bottom. As is the God, so is the votary, is a maxim worth considering. Its meaning has been distorted and men have gone astray. The means may be likened to a seed, the end to a tree, and there is just the same inviolable connection between the means and the end as there is between the seed and the tree. I am not likely to obtain the result flowing from the worship of God by laying myself prostrate before Satan. If, therefore, anyone were to say, I want to worship God, it does not matter that I do so by means of Satan, it would be set down as ignorant folly. We reap exactly as we sow. The English in 1833 obtained greater voting power by violence. Did they, by using brute force, better appreciate their duty? They wanted the right of voting which they obtained by using physical force. 
but real rights are a result of performance of duty. These rights they have not obtained. We therefore have before us in England the farce of everybody wanting and insisting on his rights, nobody thinking of his duty. And where everybody wants rights, who shall give them to whom? I do not wish to imply that they never perform their duty, but I do wish to imply that they do not want to perform the duty to which those rights should correspond. And as they do not perform that particular duty, namely acquire fitness, their rights have proved a burden to them. In other words, what they have obtained is an exact result of the means they have adopted. They use the means corresponding to the end. If I want to deprive you of your watch, I shall certainly have to fight for it. If I want to buy your watch, I shall have to pay you for it. And if I want a gift, I shall have to plead for it. And according to the means I employ, the watch is stolen property, my own property or a donation. Thus we see three different results from three different means. Will you still say that means do not matter? Now we shall take the example given by you of the thief to be driven out. I do not agree with you that the thief may be driven out by any means. If it is my father who has come to steal, I shall use one kind of means. If it is an acquaintance, I shall use another. And in the case of a perfect stranger, I shall use a third. If it is a white man, you will perhaps say you will use means different from those you will adopt with an Indian thief. If it is a weakling, the means will be different from those to be adopted for dealing with an equal in physical strength. And if the thief is armed from tip to toe, I shall simply remain quiet. Thus we have a variety of means between the father and the armed man. Again, I fancy that I should pretend to be sleeping, whether the thief was my father or that strong armed man. The reason for this is my father would also be armed and I should succumb to the strength possessed by either and allow my things to be stolen. The strength of my father would make me weep with pity. The strength of the armed man would rouse in me anger and we should become enemies. Such is the curious situation. From these examples, we may not be able to agree as to the means to be adopted in each case. I myself seem clearly to see what should be done in all these cases, but the remedy may frighten you. I therefore hesitate to place it before you. For the time being, I will leave you to guess it, and if you cannot, it is clear that you will have to adopt different means in each case. You will also have seen that any means will not avail to drive away the thief. You will have to adopt means to fit each case. Hence it follows that your duty is not to drive away the thief by any means you like. Let us proceed a little further. That well-armed man has stolen your property. You have harbored the thought. You are filled with anger. You argue that you want to punish that rogue, not for your own sake, but for the good of your neighbors. You have collected a number of armed men. You want to take his house by assault. He is duly informed of it. He runs away. He too is incensed. He collects his brother robbers and sends you a defiant message that he will commit robbery in broad daylight. You are strong. You do not fear him. You are prepared to receive him. Meanwhile, the robber pesters your neighbors. They complain before you. You reply that you are doing all for their sake. You do not mind that your own goods have been stolen. Your neighbors reply that the robber never pestered them before and that he commenced his depredations only after you declared hostilities against him. You are between Scylla and Charybdis. You are full of pity for the poor men. What they say is true. What are you to do? You will be disgraced if you now leave the robber alone. And so the battle grows the robbers increase in numbers, your neighbors have deliberately put themselves to inconvenience. 
Thus, the result of wanting to take revenge upon the robber is that you have disturbed your own peace. You are in perpetual fear of being robbed and assaulted. Your courage has given place to cowardice. If you patiently examine the argument, you will see that I have not overdrawn the picture. This is one of the means. Now let us examine the other. You set this armed robber down as an ignorant brother. You intend to reason with him at a suitable opportunity. You argue that he is, after all, a fellow man. You do not know what prompted him to steal. You therefore decide that when you can, you will destroy that man's motive for stealing. While you are thus reasoning with yourself, the man comes again to steal. Instead of being angry with him, you take pity on him. You think that this stealing habit must be a disease with him. Henceforth, you therefore keep your doors and windows open, you change your sleeping place and you keep your things in a manner most accessible to him. The robber comes again and is confused, as all this is new to him. Nevertheless, he takes away your things. But his mind is agitated. He inquires about you in the village. He comes to learn about your broad and loving heart. He repents. He begs your pardon, returns your things and leaves off the stealing habit. He becomes your servant and you find for him honorable employment. This is the second method. Thus you see, different means have brought about totally different results. I do not wish to deduce from this that all robbers will act in the above manner or that all will have the same pity and love like you, but I wish only to show that only fair means can produce fair results and that at least in the majority of cases, if not indeed in all, the force of love and pity is infinitely greater than the force of arms. There is harm in the exercise of brute force, never in that of pity. Now we will take the question of petitioning. It is a fact beyond dispute that a petition without the backing of force is useless. However, the late Justice Ranade used to say that petitions served a useful purpose because they were a means of educating people. They give the latter an idea of their condition and warn the rulers. From this point of view, they are not altogether useless. A petition of an equal is a sign of curtsy. A petition from a slave is a symbol of his slavery. A petition backed by force is a petition from an equal and when he transmits his demand in the form of a petition, it testifies to his nobility. Two kinds of force can back petitions. We will hurt you if you do not give this, is one kind of force. It is the force of arms whose evil results we have already mentioned. The second kind of force can thus be stated. If you do not concede our demand, we will be no longer your petitioners. You can govern us only so long as we remain the governed. We shall no longer have any dealings with you. The force implied in this may be described as love force, soul force, more popularly but less accurately, passive resistance. This force is indestructible. He who uses it perfectly understands his position. We have an ancient proverb which literally means one negative cures 36 diseases. The force of arms is powerless when matched against the force of love or the soul. Now we shall take your last illustration, that of the child thrusting its foot into fire. It will not avail you. What do you really do to the child? Supposing that it can exert so much physical force that it renders you powerless and rushes into the fire, then you cannot prevent it. There are only two remedies open to you. Either you must kill it in order to prevent it from perishing in the flames, or you must give your own life because you do not wish to see it perish before your very eyes. You will not kill it. If your heart is not quite full of pity, 
It is possible that you will not surrender yourself by preceding the child and going into the fire yourself. You therefore helplessly allow it to go into the flames. Thus, at any rate, you are not using physical force. I hope you will not consider that it is still physical force, though of a low order, when you would forcibly prevent the child from rushing towards the fire if you could. That force is of a different order and we have to understand what it is. Remember that in thus preventing the child you are minding entirely its own interest. You are exercising authority for its sole benefit. Your example does not apply to the English. In using brute force against the English, you consult entirely your own, that is, the national interest. There is no question here either of pity or of love. If you say that the actions of the English, being evil, represent fire, and that they proceed to their actions through ignorance, and that therefore they occupy the position of a child, and that you want to protect such a child, then you will have to overtake every such evil action by whomsoever committed. And, as in the case of the child, you will have to sacrifice yourself. If you are capable of such immeasurable pity, I wish you well in its exercise. Chapter 17 Passive Resistance Is there any historical evidence as to the success of what you have called soul force or truth force? No instance seems to have happened of any nation having risen through soul force. I still think that the evil doers will not cease doing evil without physical punishment. The poet Tulsidas has said, Of religion, pity or love is the root as egotism of the body. Therefore, we should not abandon pity so long as we are alive. This appears to me to be a scientific truth. I believe in it as much as I believe in two and two being four. The force of love is the same as the force of the soul or truth. We have evidence of its working at every step. The universe would disappear without the existence of that force. But you ask for historical evidence. It is therefore necessary to know what history means. The Gujarati equivalent means, it so happened. If that is the meaning of history, it is possible to give copious evidence. But if it means the doings of kings and emperors, there can be no evidence of soul force or passive resistance in such history. You cannot expect silver ore in a tin mine. History, as we know it, is a record of the wars of the world, and so there is a proverb among Englishmen that a nation which has no history, that is, no wars, is a happy nation. How kings played, how they became enemies of one another, and how they murdered one another is found accurately recorded in history. And if this were all that had happened in the world, it would have been ended long ago. If the story of the universe had commenced with wars, not a man would have been found alive today. Those people who have been warred against have disappeared, as for instance the natives of Australia, of whom hardly a man was left alive by the intruders. Mark, 
please, that these natives did not use soul force in self-defense. And it does not require much foresight to know that the Australians will share the same fate as their victims. Those that wield the sword shall perish by the sword. With us, the proverb is that professional swimmers will find a watery grave. The fact that there are so many men still alive in the world shows that it is based not on the force of arms, but on the force of truth or love. Therefore, the greatest and most unimpeachable evidence of the success of this force is to be found in the fact that in spite of the wars of the world, it still lives on. Thousands, indeed tens of thousands, depend for their existence on their very active working of this force. Little quarrels of millions of families in their daily lives disappear before the exercise of this force. Hundreds of nations live in peace. History does not and cannot take note of this fact. History is really a record of every interruption of the even working of the force of love or the soul. Two brothers quarrel, one of them repents and reawakens the love that was lying dormant in him. The two again begin to live in peace. Nobody takes note of this. But if the two brothers, through the intervention of solicitors or some other reason, take up arms or go to law, which is another form of the exhibition of brute force, their doings would be immediately noticed in the press, they would be the talk of their neighbors and would probably go down in history. And what is true of families and communities is true of nations. There is no reason to believe that there is one law for families and another for nations. History then is a record of an interruption of the course of nature. Soul force being natural is not noted in history. According to what you say, it is plain that instances of this kind of passive resistance are not to be found in history. It is necessary to understand this passive resistance more fully. It will be better therefore if you enlarge upon it. Passive resistance is a method of securing rights by personal suffering. It is the reverse of resistance by arms. When I refuse to do a thing that is repugnant to my conscience, I use soul force. For instance, the government of the day has passed a law which is applicable to me. I do not like it. If by using violence I force the government to repeal the law, I am employing what may be termed body force. If I do not obey the law and accept the penalty for its breach, I use soul force. It involves the sacrifice of self. Everybody admits that sacrifice of self is infinitely superior to sacrifice of others. Moreover, if this kind of force is used in a cause that is unjust, only the person using it suffers. He does not make others suffer for his mistakes. Men have before now done many things which were subsequently found to have been wrong. No man can claim to be absolutely in the right or that a particular thing is wrong because he thinks so. But it is wrong for him so long as that is his deliberate judgment. It is therefore meet that he should not do that which he knows to be wrong and suffer the consequences, whatever it may be. This is the key to the use of soul force. You would then disregard laws? This is rank disloyalty. We have always been considered a law-abiding nation. You seem to be going even beyond the extremists. They say that we must obey the laws that have been passed, but that if the laws be bad, we must drive out the lawgivers even by force. Whether I go beyond them or whether I do not is a matter of no consequence to either of us. We simply want to find out what is right and to act accordingly. The real meaning of the statement that we are a law-abiding nation is that we are passive resistors. When we do not like certain laws, we do not break the heads of lawgivers, but we suffer and do not submit to the laws. That we should obey laws, whether good or bad, is a newfangled notion. There was no such thing in former days. 
The people disregarded those laws that they did not like and suffered the penalties for their breach. It is contrary to our manhood if we obey laws repugnant to our conscience. Such teaching is opposed to religion and means slavery. If the government were to ask us to go about without any clothing, should we do so? If I were a passive resistor, I would say to them that I would have nothing to do with their law. But we have so forgotten ourselves and become so compliant that we do not mind any degrading law. A man who has realized his manhood, who fears only God, will fear no one else. Man-made laws are not necessarily binding on him. Even the government do not expect any such thing from us. They do not say, you must do such and such thing, but they say, if you do not do it, we will punish you. We are sunk so low that we fancy that it is our duty and our religion to do what the law lays down. If man will only realize that it is unmanly to obey laws that are unjust, no man's tyranny will enslave him. This is the key to self-rule or home rule. It is a superstition and an ungodly thing to believe that an act of a majority binds a minority. Many examples can be given in which acts of majorities will be found to have been wrong and those of minorities to have been right. All reforms owe their origin to the initiation of minorities in opposition to majorities. If among a band of robbers a knowledge of robbing is obligatory, is a pious man to accept the obligation? So long as the superstition that men should obey unjust laws exists, so long will their slavery exist. And a passive resistor alone can remove such a superstition. To use brute force, to use gunpowder, is contrary to passive resistance. For it means that we want our opponent to do by force that which we desire, but he does not. And if such a use of force is justifiable, surely he is entitled to do likewise by us. And so we should never come to an agreement. We may simply fancy, like the blind horse moving in a circle round a mill, that we are making progress. Those who believe that they are not bound to obey laws which are repugnant to their conscience have only the remedy of passive resistance open to them. Any other must lead to disaster. From what you say, I deduce that passive resistance is a splendid weapon of the weak, but that when they are strong, they may take up arms. This is gross ignorance. Passive resistance, that is soul force, is matchless. It is superior to the force of arms. How then can it be considered only a weapon of the weak? Physical force men are strangers to the courage that is requisite in a passive resistor. Do you believe that a coward can ever disobey a law that he dislikes? Extremists are considered to be advocates of brute force. Why do they then talk about obeying laws? I do not blame them. They can say nothing else. When they succeed in driving out the English and they themselves become governors, they will want you and me to obey their laws. And this is a fitting thing for their contribution. But a passive resistor will say that he will not obey a law that is against his conscience, even though he may be blown to pieces at the mouth of a cannon. What do you think? Wherein is courage required? In blowing others to pieces from behind a cannon? or with a smiling face to approach a cannon and be blown to pieces. Who is the true warrior? He who keeps death always as a bosom friend, or he who controls the death of others? Believe me that a man devoid of courage and manhood can never be a passive resistor. This, however, I will admit that even a man weak in body is capable of offering this resistance. One man can offer it just as well as millions. Both men and women can indulge in it. It does not require the training of an army. It needs no jujitsu. Control over the mind is alone necessary. And when that is attained, man is free like the king of the forest and his very glance withers the enemy. 
Passive resistance is an all-sided sword. It can be used anyhow. It blesses him who uses it and him against whom it is used. Without drawing a drop of blood, it produces far-reaching results. It never rusts and cannot be stolen. Competition between passive resistors does not exhaust. The sword of passive resistance does not require a scabbard. It is strange indeed that you should consider such a weapon to be a weapon merely of the weak. You have said that passive resistance is a speciality of India. Have cannons never been used in India? Evidently, in your opinion, India means its few princes. To me, it means its teeming millions on whom depends the existence of its princes and our own. Kings will always use their kingly weapons. To use force is bred in them. They want to command. But those who have to obey commands do not want guns. And these are in a majority throughout the world. They have to learn either body force or soul force. Where they learn the former, both the rules and the ruled become like so many madmen. But where they learn soul force, the commands of the rulers do not go beyond the point of their swords. For true men disregard unjust commands. Peasants have never been subdued by the sword and never will be. They do not know the use of the sword and they are not frightened by the use of it by others. That nation is great, which rests its head upon death as its pillow. Those who defy death are free from all fear. For those who are laboring under the delusive charms of brute force, this picture is not overdrawn. The fact is that in India, the nation at large has generally used passive resistance in all departments of life. We cease to cooperate with our rulers when they displease us. This is passive resistance. I remember an instance when in a small principality, the villagers were offended by some command issued by the prince. The former immediately began vacating the village. The prince became nervous, apologized to his subjects and withdrew his command. Many such instances can be found in India. Real home rule is possible only where passive resistance is the guiding force of the people. Any other rule is foreign rule. Then you will say that it is not at all necessary for us to train the body? I will certainly not say any such thing. It is difficult to become a passive resistor unless the body is trained. As a rule, the mind residing in a body that has become weakened by pampering is also weak and where there is no strength of mind, there can be no strength of soul. We will have to improve our physique by getting rid of infant marriages and luxurious living. If I were to ask a man having a shattered body to face a cannon's mouth, I would make of myself a laughing stock. From what you say then, it would appear that it is not a small thing to become a passive resistor. And if that is so, I would like you to explain how a man may become a passive resistor. To become a passive resistor is easy enough, but it is also equally difficult. I have known a lad of 14 years become a passive resistor. I have known also sick people doing likewise, and I have also known physically strong and otherwise happy people being unable to take up passive resistance. And after a great deal of experience, it seems to me that those who want to become passive resistors for the service of the country have to observe perfect chastity, adopt poverty, follow truth and cultivate fearlessness. Chastity is one of the greatest disciplines without which the mind cannot attain requisite firmness. A man who is unchaste loses stamina, become emasculated and cowardly. He whose mind is given over to animal passions is not capable of any great effort. This can be proved by innumerable instances. What then is a married man to do is the question that arises naturally and yet it need not. When a husband and wife gratify the passions, it is no less an animal indulgence on that account. Such an indulgence, except for perpetuating the race, is strictly prohibited. 
But a passive resistor has to avoid even that very limited indulgence because he can have no desire for progeny. A married man, therefore, can observe perfect chastity. This subject is not capable of being treated at greater length. Several questions arise. How is one to carry one's wife with one? What are her rights and other such questions? Yet those who wish to take part in a great work are bound to solve these puzzles. Just as there is necessity for chastity, so is there for poverty. Pecuniary ambition and passive resistance cannot go well together. Those who have money are not expected to throw it away, but they are expected to be indifferent about it. They must be prepared to lose every penny rather than give up passive resistance. Passive resistance has been described in the course of our discussion as truth force. Truth, therefore, has necessarily to be followed, and that at any cost. In this connection, academic questions such as whether a man may not lie in order to save a life, etc., arise. But these questions occur only to those who wish to justify lying. Those who want to follow truth every time are not placed in such a quandary, and if they are, they are still saved from a false position. Passive resistance cannot proceed a step without fearlessness. Those alone can follow the path of passive resistance who are free from fear, whether as to their possessions, false honor, their relatives, the government, bodily injuries, death. These observances are not to be abandoned in the belief that they are difficult. Nature has implanted in the human breast ability to cope with any difficulty or suffering that may come to a man unprovoked. These qualities are worth having even for those who do not wish to serve the country. Let there be no mistake that those who want to train themselves in the use of arms are also obliged to have these qualities, more or less. Everybody does not become a warrior for the wish. A would-be warrior will have to observe chastity and to be satisfied with poverty as his lot. A warrior without fearlessness cannot be conceived of. It may be taught that he would not need to be exactly truthful, but that quality follows real fearlessness. When a man abandons truth, he does so owing to fear in some shape or form. The above four attributes then need not frighten anyone. It may be as well here to note that a physical force man has to have many other useless qualities which a passive resistor never needs. And you will find that whatever extra effort a swordsman needs is due to lack of fearlessness. If he is an embodiment of the latter, the sword will drop from his hand that very moment. He does not need its support. One who is free from hatred requires no sword. A man with a stick suddenly came face to face with a lion and instinctively raised his weapon in self-defense. The man saw that he had only prated about fearlessness when there was none in him. That moment he dropped the stick and found himself free from all fear. Chapter 18 Education In the whole of our discussion, you have not demonstrated the necessity for education. We always complain of its absence among us. We notice a movement for compulsory education in our country. 
the Maharaja Gaikwad has introduced it in his territories. Every eye is directed towards them. We bless the Maharaja for it. Is all this effort then of no use? If we consider our civilization to be the highest, I have regretfully to say that much of the effort you have described is of no use. The motive of the Maharaja and other great leaders who have been working in this direction is perfectly pure. They therefore undoubtedly deserve great praise. But we cannot conceal from ourselves the result that is likely to flow from their effort. What is the meaning of education? If it simply means a knowledge of letters, it is merely an instrument, and an instrument may well be used or abused. The same instrument that may be used to cure a patient may be used to take his life, and so may a knowledge of letters. We daily observe that many men abuse it, and very few make good use of it, and if this is a correct statement, we have proved that more harm has been done by it than good. The ordinary meaning of education is a knowledge of letters. To teach boys reading, writing and arithmetic is called primary education. A peasant earns his bread honestly. He has ordinary knowledge of the world. He knows fairly well how he should behave towards his parents, his wife, his children and his fellow villagers. He understands and observes the rules of morality, but he cannot write his own name. What do you propose to do by giving him a knowledge of letters? Will you add an inch to his happiness? Do you wish to make him discontented with his cottage or his lot? And even if you want to do that, he will not need such an education. Carried away by the flood of Western thought, we came to the conclusion without weighing pros and cons that we should give this kind of education to the people. Now let us take higher education. I have learned geography, astronomy, algebra, geometry, etc. What of that? In what way have I benefited myself or those around me? Why have I learned these things? Professor Huxley has thus defined education. That man, I think, has had a liberal education who has been so trained in youth that his body is the ready servant of his will and does with ease and pleasure all the work as a mechanism it is capable of, whose intellect is a clear, cold logic engine with all its parts of equal strength and in smooth working order, whose mind is stored with a knowledge of the fundamental truths of nature, whose passions are trained to come to heed by a vigorous will, the servant of a tender conscience, who has learned to hate all vileness and to respect others as himself. Such as one and no other, I conceive, has had a liberal education. For he is in harmony with nature. He will make the best of her and she of him. If this be true education, I must emphatically say that the sciences I have enumerated above, I have never been able to use for controlling my senses. Therefore, whether you take elementary education or higher education, it is not required for the main thing. It does not make of us men. It does not enable us to do our duty. If that is so, I shall have to ask you another question. What enables you to tell all these things to me? If you had not received higher education, how would you have been able to explain to me the things that you have? You have spoken well, but my answer is simple. I do not for one moment believe that my life would have been wasted had I not received higher or lower education. Nor do I consider that I necessarily serve because I speak. But I do desire to serve and in endeavouring to fulfil that desire, I make use of the education I have received. And if I am making good use of it, even then it is not for the millions. 
but I can use it only for such as you and this supports my contention. Both you and I have come under the bane of what is mainly false education. I claim to have become free from its ill effects and I am trying to give you the benefit of my experience and in doing so I am demonstrating the rottenness of this education. Moreover, I have not run down a knowledge of letters under all circumstances. All I have shown is that we must not make of it a fetish. It is not a kamadhuk. In its place it can be of use and it has its place when we have brought our senses under subjection and put our ethics on a firm foundation. And then if we feel inclined to receive that education, we may make good use of it. As an ornament, it is likely to sit well on us. It now follows that it is not necessary to make this education compulsory. Our ancient school system is enough. Character building has the first place in it and that is primary education. A building erected on that foundation will last. Do I then understand that you do not consider English education necessary for obtaining home rule? My answer is yes and no. To give millions a knowledge of English is to enslave them. The foundation that Macaulay laid of education has enslaved us. I do not suggest that he had any such intention, but that has been the result. Is it not a sad commentary that we should have to speak of home rule in a foreign language? As it is worthy of note that the systems which the Europeans have discarded are the systems in vogue among us. Their learned men continually make changes. We ignorantly adhere to their cast-off systems. They are trying each division to improve its own status. Wales is a small portion of England. Great efforts are being made to revive a knowledge of Welsh among Welshmen. The English Chancellor, Mr. Lloyd George, is taking a leading part in the movement to make Welsh children speak Welsh. And what is our condition? We write to each other in faulty English, and from this even our MAs are not free. Our best thoughts are expressed in English. The proceedings of our Congress are conducted in English. Our best newspapers are printed in English. If this state of things continues for a long time, posterity will, it is my firm opinion, condemn and curse us. It is worth noting that by receiving English education, we have enslaved the nation. Hypocrisy, tyranny, etc. have increased. English knowing Indians have not hesitated to cheat and strike terror into the people. Now, if we are doing anything for the people at all, we are paying only a portion of the debt due to them. Is it not a most painful thing that if I want to go to a court of justice, I must employ the English language as a medium, that when I become a barrister, I may not speak my mother tongue, and that someone else should have to translate to me from my own language? Is not this absolutely absurd? Is it not a sign of slavery? Am I to blame the English for it or myself? It is we, the English knowing men, that have enslaved India. The curse of the nation will rest not upon the English, but upon us. I have told you that my answer to your last question is both yes and no. I have explained to you why it is yes. I shall now explain why it is no. We are so much beset by the disease of civilization that we cannot altogether do without English education. Those who have already received it may make good use of it wherever necessary. In our dealings with the English people, in our dealings with our own people, when we can only correspond with them through that language, and for the purpose of knowing how much disgusted they, the English, have themselves become with their civilization, we may use or learn English, as the case may be. 
those who have studied English will have to teach morality to their progeny through their mother tongue and to teach them another Indian language. But when they have grown up, they may learn English, the ultimate aim being that we should not need it. The object of making money thereby should be eschewed. Even in learning English to such a limited extent, we will have to consider what we should learn through it and what we should not. It will be necessary to know that what sciences we should learn. A little thought should show you immediately we cease to care for English degrees, the rulers will prick up their ears. Then what education shall we give? This has been somewhat considered above, but we will consider it a little more. I think that we have to improve all our languages. What subjects we should learn through them need not be elaborated here. Those English books which are valuable, we should translate into the various Indian languages. We should abandon the pretension of learning many sciences. Religion, that is ethical education, will occupy the first place. Every cultured Indian will know in addition to his own provincial language, if a Hindu, Sanskrit, if a Mohammedan, Arabic, if a Parsi, Persian, and all Hindi. Some Hindus should know Arabic and Persian, some Mohammedans and Parsis Sanskrit. Several Northerners and Westerners should learn Tamil. A universal language for India should be Hindi with the opinion of writing it in Persian or Nagari characters. In order that the Hindus and Mohammedans may have closer relations, it is necessary to know both the characters. And if we can do this, we can drive the English language out of the field in a short time. All this is necessary for us slaves. Through our slavery, the nation has been enslaved and it will be free with our freedom. The question of religious education is very difficult. Yet, we cannot do without it. India will never be godless. Rank atheism cannot flourish in that land. The task is indeed difficult. My head begins to turn as I think of religious education. Our religious teachers are hypocritical and selfish. They will have to be approached. The mullahs, the dasturs and the brahmins hold the key in their hands. But if they will not have the good sense, the energy that we have derived from English education will have to be devoted to religious education. This is not very difficult. Only the fringe of the ocean has been polluted and it is those who are within the fringe who alone need cleansing. We who come under this category can even cleanse ourselves because my remarks do not apply to the millions. In order to restore India to its pristine condition, we have to return to it. In our own civilization, there will naturally be progress, retrogression, reforms and reactions. But one effort is required and that is to drive out Western civilization. All else will follow. Chapter 19 Historical Context The Industrial Revolution The Industrial Revolution for him was much more than a mere change in the mode of production. As he interprets it, it brought into being a new mode of life, embracing a people's outlook on nature and human nature, religion, ethics, science, knowledge, technology, politics, and economics. According to this outlook, nature was taken to be an autonomous entity operating according to its own laws, something to be mastered and possessed at will for the satisfaction of human needs, desires, and political ambitions. 
The Industrial Revolution altered the concept of labor, now accepted mainly for its ability to produce profit, power, and capital. Manual labor was looked upon as fit only for the unlettered and the backward. With the technological revolution that followed the Industrial Revolution, machines, hitherto allies of humans, seemed to assert their autonomy. Chapter 19 Machinery When you speak of driving out Western civilization, I suppose you will also say that we want no machinery. By raising this question, you have opened the wound that I had received. When I was reading Mr. Dutt's economic history of India, I wept. And as I think of it again, my heart sickens. It is machinery that has impoverished India. It is difficult to measure the harm that Manchester has done to us. It is due to Manchester that Indian handicraft has all but disappeared. But I make a mistake. How can Manchester be blamed? We wore Manchester cloth and that is why Manchester wove it. I was delighted when I read about the bravery of Bengal. There are no cloth mills in that presidency. They were therefore able to restore the original hand-weaving occupation. It is true, Bengal encourages the mill industry of Bombay. If Bengal had proclaimed a boycott of all machine-made goods, it would have been much better. Machinery has begun to desolate Europe. Ruination is now knocking at the English gates. Machinery is the chief symbol of modern civilization. It represents a great sin. The workers in the mills of Bombay have become slaves. The condition of the women working in the mills is shocking. When there were no mills, these women were not starving. If the machinery craze grows in our country, it will become an unhappy land. It may be considered a heresy, but I am bound to say that it were better for us to send money to Manchester and to use flimsy Manchester cloth than to multiply mills in India. By using Manchester cloth, we would only waste our money, but by reproducing Manchester in India, we shall keep our money at the price of our blood, because our very moral being will be sapped, and I call in support of my statement the very mill hands as witnesses. And those who have amassed wealth out of factories are not likely to be better than other rich men. It would be folly to assume that an Indian Rockefeller would be better than the American Rockefeller. Impoverished India can become free, but it will be hard for an India made rich through immorality to regain its freedom. I fear we will have to admit that moneyed men support British rule, their interest is bound up with its stability. Money renders a man helpless. The other thing as harmful is sexual vice. Both are poison. A snake bite is a lesser poison than these two because the former merely destroys the body, but the latter destroy body, mind and soul. We need not therefore be pleased with the prospect of the growth of the mill industry. Are the mills then to be closed down? That is difficult. It is no easy task to do away with the thing that is established. We therefore say that the non-beginning of a thing is supreme wisdom. We cannot condemn mill owners. We can but pity them. It would be too much to expect them to give up the mills, but we may implore them not to increase them. If they would be good, they would gradually contract their business. They can establish in thousands of households the ancient and sacred handlooms, and they can buy out the cloth that may be thus woven. Whether the mill owners do this or not, 
people can cease to use machine made goods you have so far spoken about machine made cloth but there are innumerable machine made things we have either to import them or to introduce machinery into our country indeed our goods even are made in germany what need then to speak of matches pins and glassware my answer can only be one what did india do before these articles were introduced precisely the same should be done today as long as we cannot make pins without machinery so long will we do without them the tinsel splendor of glassware we will have nothing to do with and we will make wicks as of old with home grown cotton and use handmade earthen sources for lamps so doing we shall save our eyes and money and will support swadeshi and so shall we attain home rule it is not to be conceived that all men will do all these things at one time or that some men will give up all machine made things at once but if the thought is sound we will always find out what we can give up and will gradually cease to use this what a few may do others will copy and the movement will grow like the coconut of the mathematical problem what the leaders do the populace will gladly follow the matter is neither complicated nor difficult you and i shall not wait until we carry others with us those will be the losers who will not do it and those who will not do it although they appreciate the truth will deserve to be called cowards what then of the tram cars and electricity this question is now too late it signifies nothing if we are to do without the railways what shall we have to do without the tram cars machinery is like a snake hole which may contain from 1 to 100 snakes where there is machinery there are large cities and where there are large cities there are tram cars and railways and there only does one see electric light english villages do not boast any of these things honest physicians will tell you that where means of artificial locomotion have increased the health of the people has suffered i remember that when in a european town there was a scarcity of money the receipts of the tramway company of the lawyers and of the doctors went down and the people were less unhealthy i cannot recall a single good point in connection with machinery books can be written to demonstrate its evils is it a good point or a bad one that all you are saying will be printed through machinery this is one of those instances which demonstrate that sometimes poison is used to kill poison this then will not be a good point regarding machinery as it expires the machinery as it were says to us beware and avoid me you will derive no benefit from me and the benefit that may accrue from printing will avail only those who are infected with the machinery craze do not therefore forget the main thing it is necessary to realize that machinery is bad we shall then be able gradually to do away with it nature has not provided anywhere whereby we may reach a desired goal all of a sudden if instead of welcoming machinery as a boon we would look upon it as an evil it would ultimately go Chapter 20 Conclusion Chapter 20 
from your views, I gather that you would form a third party. You are neither an extremist nor a moderate. That is a mistake. I do not think of a third party at all. We do not all think alike. We cannot say that all the moderates hold identical views and how can those who want to serve only have a party? I would serve both the moderates and the extremists. Where I should differ from them, I would respectfully place my position before them and continue my service. What then would you say to both the parties? I would say to the extremists, I know that you want home rule for India. It is not to be had for your asking. Everyone will have to take it for himself. What others get for me is not home rule, but foreign rule. Therefore, it would not be proper for you to say that you have obtained home rule if you expelled the English. I have already described the true nature of home rule. This you would never obtain by force of arms. Brute force is not natural to the Indian soil. You will have therefore to rely wholly on soul force. You must not consider that violence is necessary at any stage for reaching our goal. I would say to the moderates, mere petitioning is derogatory. We thereby confess inferiority. To say that British rule is indispensable is almost a denial of the Godhead. We cannot say that anybody or anything is indispensable except God. Moreover, common sense should tell us that to state that for the time being the presence of the English in India is a necessity is to make them conceited. If the English vacated India bag and baggage, it must not be supposed that she would be widowed. It is possible that those who are forced to observe peace under their pressure would fight after their withdrawal. There can be no advantage in suppressing an eruption. It must have its vent. If, therefore, before we can remain at peace, we must fight amongst ourselves, it is better that we do so. There is no occasion for a third party to protect the weak. It is this so-called protection which has unnerved us. Such protection can only make the weak weaker. Unless we realize this, we cannot have home rule. I would paraphrase the thought of an English divine and say that anarchy under home rule were better than orderly foreign rule. Only the meaning that the learned divine attached to home rule is different from Indian home rule according to my conception. We have to learn and to teach others that we do not want the tyranny of either English rule or Indian rule. If this idea were carried out, both the extremists and the moderates could join hands. There is no occasion to fear or distrust one another. What then would you say to the English? To them, I would respectfully say, I admit you are my rulers. It is not necessary to debate the question whether you hold India by the sword or by my consent. I have no objection to your remaining in my country, but although you are the rulers, you will have to remain as servants of the people. It is not we who have to do as you wish, but it is you who have to do as we wish. You may keep the riches that you have drained away from this land, but you may not drain riches henceforth. Your function will be, if you so wish, to police India. You must abandon the idea of deriving any commercial benefit from us. We hold the civilization that you support to be the reverse of civilization. We consider our civilization to be far superior to yours. If you realize this truth, it will be to your advantage and if you do not, according to your own proverb, you should only live in our country in the same manner as we do. You must not do anything that is contrary to our religions. It is your duty as rulers that for the sake of the Hindus you should eschew beef and for the sake of the Mohammedans you should avoid bacon and ham. 
We have hitherto said nothing because we have been cowed down, but you need not consider that you have not hurt our feelings by your conduct. We are not expressing our sentiments either through base selfishness or fear, but because it is our duty now to speak out boldly. We consider your schools and law courts to be useless. We want our own ancient schools and courts to be restored. The common language of India is not English, but Hindi. You should therefore learn it. We can hold communication with you only in our national language. We cannot tolerate the idea of your spending money on railways and the military. We see no occasion for either. You may fear Russia, we do not. When she comes, we will look after her. If you are with us, we will then receive her jointly. We do not need any European cloth. We will manage with articles produced and manufactured at home. You may not keep one eye on Manchester and the other on India. We can work together if our interests are identical. This has not been said to you in arrogance. You have great military resources. Your naval power is matchless. If we wanted to fight with you on your own ground, we should be unable to do so. But if the above submissions be not acceptable to you, we cease to play the ruled. You may, if you like, cut us to pieces. You may shatter us at the cannon's mouth. If you act contrary to our will, we will not help you. And without our help, we know that you cannot move one step forward. It is likely that you will laugh at all this in the intoxication of your power. We may not be able to disillusion you at once, but if there be any manliness in us, you will see shortly that your intoxication is suicidal and that your laugh at our expense is an aberration of intellect. We believe that at heart you belong to a religious nation. We are living in a land which is the source of religions. How we came together need not be considered, but we can make mutual good use of our relations. You English who have come to India are not a good specimen of the English nation, nor can we almost half anglicized Indians be considered a good specimen of the real Indian nation. If the English nation were to know all you have done, it would oppose many of your actions. The mass of the Indians have had few dealings with you. If you will abandon your so-called civilization and search into our own scriptures, you will find that our demands are just. Only on condition of our demands being fully satisfied may you remain in India, and if you remain under those conditions, we shall learn several things from you, and you will learn many from us. So doing, we shall benefit each other and the world, but that will happen only when the root of our relationship is sunk in a religious soil. What will you say to the nation? Who is the nation? For our purposes, it is the nation that you and I have been thinking of. That is, those of us who are affected by European civilization and who are eager to have home rule. To these, I would say, it is only those Indians who are imbued with real love who will be able to speak to the English in the above strain without being frightened. And those only can be said to be so imbued who conscientiously believe that Indian civilization is the best and that European is a nine days wonder. Such ephemeral civilizations have often come and gone and will continue to do so. Those only can be considered to be so imbued who, having experienced the force of the soul within themselves, will not cower before brute force and will not on any account desire to use brute force. Those only can be considered to have been so imbued who are intensely dissatisfied with the present pitiable condition, having already drunk the cup of poison. If there be only one such Indian, he will speak as above to the English, and the English will have to listen to him. These demands are not demands, but they show our mental state. We will get nothing by asking. We shall have to take what we want, and we need the requisite strength for the effort, and that strength will be available to him only who, one, 
will only on rare occasions make use of the English language. 2. If a lawyer will give up his profession and take up a handloom. 3. If a lawyer will devote his knowledge to enlightening both his people and the English. 4. If a lawyer will not meddle with the quarrels between parties, but will give up the courts and from his experience induce the people to do likewise. 5. If a lawyer will refuse to be a judge as he will give up his profession. 6. If a doctor will give up medicine and understand that rather than mending bodies, he should mend souls. 7. If a doctor, he will understand that no matter to what religion he belong, it is better that bodies remain diseased rather than they are cured through the instrumentality of the diabolical vivisection that is practiced in European schools of medicine. 8. Although a doctor will take up a handloom, and if any patients come to him, will tell them the cause of their diseases and will advise them to remove the cause rather than pamper them by giving useless drugs. He will understand that if by not taking drugs perchance the patient dies, the world will not come to grief and that he will have been really merciful to him. 9. Although a wealthy man, regardless of his wealth, will speak out his mind and fear no one. 10. If a wealthy man will devote his money to establishing handlooms and encourage others to use handmade goods by wearing them himself. 11. Like every Indian, will know that this is a time for repentance, expiation and mourning. 12. Like every Indian will know that to blame the English is useless, that they came because of us and remain also for the same reason, and that they will either go or change their nature only when we reform ourselves. 13. Like others will understand that at a time of mourning there can be no indulgence and that whilst we are in a fallen state to be in jail or in banishment is much the best. 14. Like others will know that it is superstition to imagine it necessary that we should guard against being imprisoned in order that we may deal with the people. 15. Like others will know that action is much better than speech, that it is our duty to say exactly what we think and face the consequences, and that it will be only then that we shall be able to impress anybody with our speech. 16. Like others will understand that we will become free only through suffering. 17. Like others will understand that deportation for life to the Andamans is not enough expiation for the sin of encouraging European civilization. 18. Like others will know that no nation has risen without suffering, that even in physical warfare the true test is suffering and not the killing of others. Much more so is the warfare of passive resistance. 19. Like others, will know that it is an idle excuse to say that we will do a thing when the others also do it, that we should do what we know to be right, and that others will do it when they see the way. That when I fancy a particular delicacy, I do not wait till others taste it, and that to make a national effort and to suffer are in the nature of delicacies, and that to suffer under pressure is no suffering. This is a large order. When will all carry it out? You make a mistake. You and I have nothing to do with the others. Let each do his duty. If I do my duty, that is, serve myself, I shall be able to serve others. Before I leave you, I will take the liberty of repeating. 1. Real home rule is self-rule or self-control. 2. The way to it is passive resistance, that is, soul force or love force. 3. 
In order to exert this force, Swadeshi in every sense is necessary. 4. What we want to do should be done not because we object to the English or that we want to retaliate, but because it is our duty to do so. Thus, supposing that the English remove the salt tax, restore our money, give the highest posts to Indians, withdraw the English troops, we shall certainly not use their machine-made goods, nor use the English language, nor many of their industries. It is worth noting that these things are, in their nature, harmful. Hence, we do not want them. I bear no enmity towards the English, but I do towards their civilization. In my opinion, we have used the term Swaraj without understanding its real significance. I have endeavoured to explain it as I understand it, and my conscience testifies that my life henceforth is dedicated to its attainment. You have been listening to Hind Swaraj, written by Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, an oral cinematic experience, narrated by Ranjan Kamath, editor, Rishabh Kamath as reader 1, Ahan Kamath as reader 2, produced by Ahan Kamath for the C-Positive Foundation.